So hi everybody and welcome to the last session of our th three part nature recovery networks webinar series. Um, some of you might have already attended uh, our previous um, sessions uh, so, and, and seen me. So my name is Nina Schomburg and I am the coordinator for the Nature Recovery Networks project that these webinars are a part of. Um, like I touched upon already, we've already had two sessions before this. Uh, the first one uh, of which really was aimed at introducing everybody to the concepts of ecological and nature recovery networks. And the second one was then looking at policy really as a delivery mechanism towards nature recovery networks. And then today's focus is really on the role of data and mapping in designing and delivering nature recovery networks. So as always, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, apart from the, the three talks that we've got on our agenda today, and the Q&A that we have at the end. We'll also be launching um, some Slido surveys throughout the day. We trialed this last week and it worked really quite well. Uh, so hopefully it will work, fingers crossed, equally well this time as well, as we've expanded. And I think we've got three Slidos that we've got scheduled for today. So hopefully that will all work. Um, we really hope that this, these are really there to, to help us learn from you guys in the audience when it comes to how we may approach our work going forward. So, so do please take the time to respond to them and, it, and it's all anonymous. So you don't need to worry about that at all. Um, in terms of the setup today, we are using Zoom's webinar uh, setup. And this means that only the hosts and the presenters will have the ability to have their cameras and mics on. I do apologize for this, but this is the sheer number. I think we've got about 50 people on the call at the moment. Uh, it's unfortunately just not really practical to bring attendees onto the screen individually or really to have breakout rooms, etc. So, and of course, we really want your full attention for the whole session today as well. So we've decided that that's the best way forward. But I do encourage you all to utilize the chat functionality. So there you can chat amongst yourselves, you can share any links and so on. And also if in case you do have any trouble at any point during, uh, during the day, do use the, the wave um, or hand up functionality. And uh, my excellent co-hosts, Laura and Monica, who are there behind the scenes, will try to, to give you a hand to the best of their ability. Um, when using the chat, do remember that you need to select who you want to direct your question to. The automatic setting is that you send your um, messages to the panel. So if in case you want to make them public to everybody, your comments or, or, or whatever, and do make sure to choose the um, all panelists and all attendees option. When it then comes to posing questions to our panel during the Q&A, please use the Q&A functionality and not the chat. Um, again, with the number of you on the call, uh, there's a possibility, obviously, that we won't be able to go through all of the questions. So uh, there is a, um, a functionality, I think, again, it's like a thumb up uh, functionality, which will uh, allow you to upvote questions. So that will very much help us to prioritize then when it comes to those questions that we will actually be posing to our panel uh, during the Q&A. So use that, please. Um, but obviously we'll go through this in a little bit more detail when it comes to the Q&A. Um, we will be recording uh, these sessions. Um, so if you could make sure Laura and, um, and Monica, they, we've got the recording on, please. Um, so in case you have any concerns on, on that, do uh, get in touch with me um, after this session. We'll, you'll find my contact details um, on the last slide. Um, and lastly, in case we have any tweeters in the room today, please do use the hashtag Nature Carbon Networks NI and tag our account at NRN underscore NI in your tweets, and that will allow us to interact with you throughout the day. 
So uh, quickly, just to recap um, why we are talking about Nature Economy Networks in the first place, in case we have people on the call today who haven't attended those previous sessions. Um, we do know that habitat loss and fragmentation are the main drivers of biodiversity loss globally. To put this into context for Northern Ireland, um, research carried out by the Natural History Museum and RSBB revealed that Northern Ireland is in fact 12th worst in the world when it comes to biodiversity loss. So clearly there is something needs to change in terms of how, when it comes to how we look after our environment and um, how our policies look like when it comes to environmental management going forward. And this is when we talk, start talking about um, ecological networks and nature carbon networks. This sort of thinking uh, really stems from as far back as the 1970s and the understanding of how the interconnectedness and distribution of metapopulations and more widely the networks of ecosystems across the wider landscape it really supports the need of what has since been called ecological networks. So fundamentally, ecological networks as a concept really represents a culmination of an array of insights towards addressing conservation needs and particularly addressing them effectively. And in particular, it's an approach which ensures that critical areas are being protected. It has an emphasis on ecolog ecological coherence especially through um, delivering connectivity between habitat patches and also making sure that critical areas for biodiversity are being buffered uh, from the effects of damaging external activities. So I guess what the key here is, is working towards this ecologically um, coherent network of habitats that are not just um, uh, functionally there or structurally there, but they also function for the purpose that they are there for, which is obviously to maintain our biodiversity. While in some countries work has officially been ongoing since as far back as the 1990s really on a national level, in the UK it's really only been in the last couple of years that this has really started to gain wide scale momentum and more than everything policy support as well. This has largely been driven by the landmark 2010 report called Making Space for Nature by Sir Lawton and his colleagues. And what this did was really they put it in black and white how the current approach towards looking after our environment just isn't enough to safeguard our biodiversity. And it highlighted the need to bring about bigger, better, more and more connected habitats for wildlife. And these are the four lot on principles that many of you might have heard of before. The last decade has also brought about further evolution of this thinking and beyond and this understanding that beyond purely looking at the ecological benefits of these habitats, but also highlighting that while the primary role is should be supporting biodiversity, there should also be opportunities taken to highlight the joint benefits for people as well. And this is in shape of what we call ecosystem services. Um, so these include um, the likes of flood alleviation, recreational opportunities and climate change adaptation and mitigation abilities that these habitats may have. And this is really what we now call nature recovery networks and which is why we also um, adopted this um, as I guess the working concept for this project that we're working on. So naturally, this is really where uh, mapping is starting to play a role. Uh, what this means is generally is mapping out where do we have our existing core areas in uh, shape of existing protected sites, um, priority habitats, for example. Where do we have or where could we also have um, corridors and stepping stones in between these sites, these core areas? where restoration and habitat creation could take place to either eventually become core areas or these corridors or stepping stones in their own right, and how these important features and sites could and should be buffered from the impact of external pressures. And um, beyond that also, how the wider landscape could be made more permeable for wildlife, making them what we call sustainable use areas. 
So what ma mapping these components is really trying to do is to deliver towards those four Lawton principles that I touched upon just before. Um, so if we had this coherent network of designated sites, so one, they were a all in favorable condition, they were big enough and there was enough of them, they can really start to act as these sources for populations from where individuals can start to spill out from into the wider landscape, which can then obviously, which is when these species can start to utilize also the corridors and stepping stones to move about the wider landscape. So if this was realized, uh, a part or the whole of this network then should be able to withstand uh, any changes or unexpected pressures to the processes that control the structures and the function of these networks and these habitat patches and thus bring about long-term resilience. So in terms of why we're here today, um, since September last year, together with RSBB and I, Ulster Wildlife National Trust and Woodland Trust, in the spirit of the Landscape Conservation Partnership Agreement, which was um, signed on a UK wide level a few years ago, and with generous funding from the Lottery Heritage Fund, we've been running this capacity building project, exploring really what, whether and, and how in particular, we could bring about this concept of nature recovery networks into Northern Ireland. And as part of this project, we will be conducting a national scale mapping exercise in order to increase our understanding um, on our current land cover and what it's like. And also to start highlighting where there's potential to start enhancing this existing network of habitats and habitat patches which is of course why we are here today and why we're talking about mapping today. But beyond this, we are also exploring appropriate policy avenues uh, for delivery and working on producing case studies to really to showcase how the policy and, and mapping, I guess, could come together and how, what this all could uh, look like in practice. So in terms of uh, today's session in particular, uh, it's obvious that we really need to do our own thinking when it comes to what this all could, but most importantly, should look like um, for Northern Ireland. So as part of today's session, we will be hearing from our wonderful set of presenters to highlight what sort of mapping um, has and is being conducted. And in particular for day, today, we are hearing from England, we are hearing from Scotland, and we're hearing also more locally from Northern Ireland. And we are really trying to pick up learnings from these um, and how these could potentially contribute toward our own approach. So we are obviously very grateful for our presenters um, on the call today and their willingness to also take part in the Q&A at the end. So thank you very much for that. And for in terms of the, you in the audience, please do take the opportunity to learn from them and to ask, ask the questions throughout the day um, and more specifically, really during the Q&A. So uh, to really get us started, uh, and before we really um, impact you, I guess, with our talks today, we would really like, you, like to ask you this question. Um, I have prepared a Slido link, uh, which uh, Laura and uh, Monica will be sharing with you now uh, in the chat. Uh, basically, uh, what the, this functionality will allow us to do is for us to really see live on the screen your responses to this question. And there's three ways really that you can um, use Slido. Uh, you, if you have a smartphone, you can simply use the QR code, uh, which is there on the left top corner. And you can use your camera basically on your phone and that should bring up the link, which should, should bring you to the Slido website where you can uh, give your response. Uh, alternatively, you can simply use the link that will be put into the chat. Uh, or thirdly, you can simply go to slido.com and use the NRN underscore NI underscore number three code um, to, to attend the, I guess the room where this question will be posed. And obviously the question that is there on the screen, um, which is what do you think 
are the key components of nature recovery network design in, for Northern Ireland. So this could include particular data sets, looking at things at a certain scale, as an example, including sir, um, uh, citizen science going forward to contribute towards the mapping as well and that design ecosystem services. Um, so we'll leave this live here for a little while. Um, uh, you can put in more than one answer, and as you can see, some of these are getting bigger on the screen. So that means people are basically giving us the same, same responses. And management systems to be included as well, climate change action. So there's a lot of people are highlighting really that need of, of the inclusion of those ecosystem services there as well. And in terms of the later slidos as well, obviously the link will be the same. So in case you have used another device or gone on, on a separate, um, onto the, the website, you can leave that open. It should update itself when we get to the later slido uh, questions as well. We've got responses still coming in. So we'll give it a few more minutes. Again, key stakeholders working together, that partnership and collaboration being really important. Ground truth thing. A lot of surveying, a lot of field work, bioblisses, um, citizen science, and that collaboration, I think, is really what is coming through. And species data sets as well, prior to habitat data sets. I think we will leave it there, um, just so we can start um, in terms of, of our talks today. And thank you very, very much for responses. And obviously, we will get a record of this, which it's very useful for us. Um, so, I, well, what I'll do, I'll leave that on while I give you an introduction to our first speaker today. So uh, first speaker um, we have coming up is Sarah Taylor. Sarah is a senior specialist in the climate change adaptation, um, is a senior specialist in climate change adaptation at Natural England. Uh, Natural England being the government advisor on nature conservation for England. She provides expertise in climate change adaptation for the natural environment, a national and, and local level, including the production of resources that help people deliver climate change adaptation and nature-based solutions for people and nature. Sarah also works in the production and use of spatial data, ecological networks, um, including the nature recovery networks, green infrastructure and climate change in planning, as well as working towards embedding climate change adaptation through the range of work carried out by their local delivery teams. Sarah's work also includes sharing climate change information through a range of communication opportunities. And these include our organ um, uh, National England as an organization and organization wide climate change network including locally based climate change representatives and providing knowledge exchange and training for other parts of the organization and externally. She also works closely with partners across the DEFRA family, including the Environment Agency and the Forestry Commission, other country agencies, national parks, NGOs, uh, which as an example um, would be RSPB, and also local authorities, universities and others. And this really is to ensure we join up on our work on climate change adaptation and work on this together. She's also a member of the co, co, co <laughs> she's also a member of the coordinator group for the Collective for Climate Action um, across the for grassroots community based group who want to do more to combat climate change and raise awareness of key issues. So what I'll do here, I'll stop sharing my screen. And that should allow 
Sarah to come up. So please, um, thank you very much for being here, Sarah, and do fire away. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. Can you see everything okay? Yep. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you, Nina, for that introduction. And thank you very much for having me here today. It's really great to be here and be part of uh, the range of different um, sessions you've been having. So thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm here. I do work on climate change adaptation specifically, but I'm here to talk about some of the spatial data and how uh, we've been working on that over many years and, and how that fits into some of the other resources that we have and, and the planning that we undertake. Um, just to say that this is not just my work, you know, what, I, what I'm going to run through pretty quickly here in terms of, a, you know, a, a run through of our stuff we've been working on is the uh, collaboration of, between many colleagues, many different organisations. Um, so I'll, I'll give some shout outs along the way. But um, yeah, it's a really big joint effort. Um, yeah, so as Nina mentioned, when it comes to thinking about how we respond to the need to recover our nature and to sort of think about how we deliver the Lawton principles, there's lots and lots of questions about how we might design an ecological network and how we might go about thinking how big is big enough when it comes to the network. Um, what do our current sites bring to this network and where the new sites might need to be? And that hierarchy of principles, you know, which, where do we put the bigger stuff, where do we create more and where do we join things up? And then, of course, how do we um, approach uh, dealing with the needs of different species and, and different habitats and uh, restoring natural processes um, and providing ecosystem based adaptation? So there's a lot to think about. And we have been thinking about it, as Nina uh, talked about, for quite some time now. Um, and we very much believe that spatial data and the tools that we have can help us think about these actions and think about these options. Um, but as has been mentioned on the Slido poll, you know, we really do need to work together and bring our resources together uh, and use things in a sort of collaborative way, both the spatial stuff and the on the ground stuff and the partnership working. Um, and it's really important to make sure for us at least, um, and I think for, for, for all of us, that climate change action and, um, and multifunctionality in terms of the, what, a, what a network provides run through the very core of a nature network. We, as I said, we've been thinking about this for a long time and we've been working with lots and lots of people. And this is just a list of some of the spatial data that we've, or tools that we've designed or we've had a hand in or we've used significantly over the years. And um, we, I'd like to go through a few of these with you today, just to very briefly introduce them. To give you a picture of that, um, the overarching kind of piece that we're trying to find all those pieces of the puzzle, as Nina mentioned, that come together to help us provide different parts, different components of an ecological network and guide our thinking. Um, we're also working on now how best to combine these data sets and what kinds of frameworks and resources go with them to help people use them. So I'm going to start by talking about our National Habitat Network project, uh, mapping project. Um, again, we've been talking closely with Nina about this and about the, the, the opportunity or the framework, the tool that this, this provides. We've been thinking for many years uh, about how to create a uh, National Habitat Network, and we finally got ourselves to a product that we're really happy with. It's, we feel like it's the, a bit of a baseline products for us. It's based on uh, priority habitats, our priority habitat inventory, um, but as and when there's a new data set that um, can provide that baseline of land use that's, uh, that's better than our priority habitat inventory, it's, it's, uh, we're able to draw that in. But it basically starts with the idea that we want to locate where we have our current best habitats and then where we want to uh, support them. And this uh, approach will now provides us with a kind of standard network mapping approach uh, that we can use with these uh, baseline kind of habitats where they currently are. We have, uh, as I've said, a mapping tool that allows us to uh, redo things. So it's really, it, it can be really important to make sure you've set yourself out with a, a tool that can give you that flexibility. So you, when you've got new data, you can put it in, or when you want to do something in a, 
you know, for us, we're doing it at national scale, but when you want to do something at a, a more local regional scale, or when you get new and updated satellite data that you want to bring in. So it's easy to rerun the uh, model. Um, we want to make sure that it complements some of the guidance and thoughts about that we have about natural functioning of habitats and ecosystems. This is really important because, as I've said, it's based on priority habitats, but we want to put it in the context of a naturally functioning system. So we, there's a couple of links there about resources that we've used and specialists in these areas that we've um, talked to uh, to ensure that um, the approach is compatible with that kind of integrated thinking about biodiversity. What we've come up with is um, three separate outputs, and I'll show you how we get to our, the, the um, the, the uh, National Habitat Network itself uh, in a series of maps as we go through. Uh, but we've got a combined map where we're looking at all habitats together. We've grouped some habitats together where they seem to make sense. And we've also looked at individual habitat mapping. And it's just, I just need to be clear, this isn't our nature recovery network, but it is one of the key components of it. And it will be within our nature recovery network toolkit, which is going to draw together the, the um, tools and, and uh, resources that are helpful for designing nature recovery networks. Uh, this is just a list of the habitats that it includes. So we, uh, most of our priority habitats are listed here. Um, and there's a couple that aren't covered mainly because we don't have the data for them. Sometimes it's more like the habitat is actually not a priority habitat. It's in the inventory as one, but it isn't a priority habitat. That's a coastal floodplain and grazing marsh. That's more of something that can be restored to a better state. So I'm gonna take you through how it builds up. We start with the core components. There are four core components. And this is the individual habitat network map as it builds up through uh, the process. We start with the primary habitat. In this case, this is uh, lowland dry acid grassland in the green areas. There's a light green area that's just come in there. It's quite hard to see just some small areas of light green habitat, but we're calling this as associated habitats. We've done an exercise of looking at habitats that, co that always or usually exist within the proximity of lowland dry acid grassland in a, um, so that we are not assuming that these habitats are single habitats separated from everything else. They, they exist in a matrix and they have relationships with other habitats. So here, this would be uh, lowland, um, probably lowland acid grassland and uh, lowland fen perhaps in this area in close proximity to the lowland dry acid grassland. Oh sorry, this is lowland heathland in the uh, green and then the acid grassland and fen is in the light green. Sorry, a bit of a mistake there. Then we look at where we know there to be habitat creation or restoration in association with the central habitat. So this is largely through agri-environment scheme options. So that's the yellow areas where we know there are options of habitat creation and restoration that are either lowland heathland or associated habitats or you know providing something to that um, lowland heathland. So it's building up this picture where there's a matrix of habitats and a matrix of action going on in, uh, in and around that core primary habitat. And lastly, we bring in some uh, restorable habitat that's in the kind of buff color here. And um, this is in some of our, with some of our habitats and in the priority habitat inventory, we have some non-priority habitat uh, areas. So this, for example, is areas of fragmented heat. So it's not the quality of a priority habitat, but it, it could be. So it's an area, it gives you a clue that there are things uh, that can be restored to the priority habitat level. There are other things in our uh, inventory like good quality semi-improved grassland, and things like that, that would we could use um, to, to give us these areas of restorable habitat and also some uh, categories of no main habitat where, but we know there's a habitat there that could be restored. So that makes up our core components of our net, network, what's there at the moment. Then we draw around that a variable buffer, but we're looking at the buffered area, it's 500 meters that goes out from those core components. Uh, reaches out slightly further in the direction of other habitats or other core components. So it is slightly variable. It's not stuck at 100, uh, 500 meters. But what it does, it does this buffering over only areas of suitable soils for the habitat creation. So it's smarter than just a buffer around the current stuff. It's looking for the uh, areas of, of soils where we could actually restore the core primary habitat. 
And we've got two zones there. You can see network enhancement zone one, which is where the soils do exist for the creation of this habitat. And network enhancement zone two is where the buffer extends over areas where that soil doesn't exist. We keep it in the buffer because it could be really useful for creating uh, other um, sustainable land use areas, as Nina was talking about, or green infrastructure if it's an urban area. So it could be put to sort of more friendly land use types. Then we have also created a couple of other um, buffered areas around. So the, the background sort of lighter brown color that comes in underneath that enhancement zone, we've termed our network expansion zone. And that's where this, the, the, pop, the, the soils that have the potential to create the habitat extend wider than just that buffered area. So it gives you that larger area of potential and opportunity for habitat creation and restoration. On the other end of the spectrum, coming down to something that we want, want to focus on, we identify our fragmentation action zones. And that's where we're looking around the smallest, most fragmented bits in the current core um, components. And you can see there that sort of peach color that goes around the smaller bits. It gives you the opportunity to find those places that might, you could join up quite easily. Uh, the soils exist to create the restoration around those areas. So we have, um, yeah, the opportunities to address fragmentation. So just to give you some examples, that was a single habitat example. We've talked to our habitat specialists and we've got uh, this, for example, we talked to the coastal specialists and they thought it would be really good or a better uh, approach to group the coastal habitats together. Uh, much more dynamic system habitats very much existing in you know, relationship with each other. So this is our sort of an example of our coastal grouping of habitats. And we've gone further than that as well and created an all habitats um, map. So it gives you a better picture of what's going on at a landscape scale. The core components in this case, then just group all of the primary habitats together, all of that creation and restoration opportunity or what, what's going on in, in the, um, on the ground at the time, and also all of that restorable habitat. And then puts the enhancement and expansion zones around that across a range of different soils, still have the ability to identify the most fragmented bits. But this is more of that landscape scale picture, including all of the different habitats in the landscape. Moving on to uh, a tool called Condatis uh, that's been developed by the University of Liverpool. This is the reason I'm going to talk through the different tools that we have and the different approaches we've used is because we really feel like um, designing an ecological network is about trying to use different tools and approaches and analyses to identify the different component parts that you'll need to think about when it comes to designing an ecological network. So the first uh, habitat network approach that I described is all about um, around the current um, resource. So make buffering it, making it bigger, joining patches up, defragmented the patches. Condatis helps us look at a longer distance kind of landscape scale connectivity movement through the landscape for species. So very important when we're thinking about um, climate change and that long distance, not hopping from bit to bit in the local area, but moving quite some distance in response to change in climate. It uses uh, conductivity or electrical circuit theory. So we're thinking about the flow and movement of species through the, the different nodes of habitat that, that create that kind of uh, circuit and the electrical current of the species moving through. We've done some work with this. At first, we did a national scale stuff, look, uh, national scale approach, looking at uh, running condatis, looking at the flow of sort of um, a generic species through the landscape, but choosing the priority habitats only just to, to move to see what the species did. We also looked at the, we started the movement of the species at the bottom of England and then set the target uh, to, to the very north of uh, England and the border with Scotland. So the species just moving from bottom to top, just to investigate how um, that would work looking at the species uh, and species movement. And you can see the um, areas of, uh, you can see the high flow areas as they come through the landscape, the orange and yellow areas of the high flow. Um, and on th that's all the kind of um, the flow map on the left hand side, the right hand side is what's called bottlenecks. It's where the flow has a trouble moving from one spot to the next. So these might be the places where we focus on joining up a network and facilitating that longer distance movement. The bar graph there is we haven't got time to go into detail, but we did also look at how um, 
where our protected sites fell within those most important flow areas. So are we protecting the bits that allow the species to move through or are they falling outside of those places? And the, the dark blue is where the flow is protected for a habitat and the light blue where it's not. So it's very variable. And that's because it hasn't been planned in that way. But this kind of thing might help us plan where we want to protect things. We have also I said we're thinking about how we bring these things together as well. They're not just individual things. We want to try and see if they can come together to provide something uh, smarter. So for us recently, this just this year, we've worked on using Condatis in a slightly more, a slightly smarter way, but also in an expanded way. So we've looked at how Condatis uh, measures the flow over now our in our expansion zones and our enhancement zones. So um, the the flow here that you can see and the flow the high flow is in the in the blue color um, is through the network enhancement zone so that buffered area around the core components that we have i it's we're providing here hopefully an illustration of what the flow would look like if we created that habitat that we've identified in our national habitat network so would it make the flow better than the previous um network which is you know what we currently have so you can see here there's a clear kind of pathway through where the uh, flow is uh, stronger or faster through the center of that we're going to zoom in a moment so this is it without the flow uh, over the top this is our part of our lowland calcareous grassland network and you can see the enhancement zones the expansion zone is wider and then i'll oops run back the wrong way Adding on top Condatis and the flow through that enhancement zone, you can see that uh, it's, you know, it's, it's got a clear pathway, but the purple line is a bottleneck in this particular area. So that might draw our eye to a place that's really important to, to link up those two high flow areas in order to help that species move through this network or through this suggested or planned network, as we see it in the habitat network mapping. I'd like to move on to some climate change data now. I appreciate I'm, I'm giving a lot of information here today and it's just a whistle stop, but I think it illustrates how many component parts and how many things we need to think about. So I've been working on this for many years, the National Biodiversity Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment. Um, we wanted to represent uh, spatially uh, vulnerable habitats. And this is based on our priority habitat inventory again. Uh, we're try aiming to provide a decision support tool to help us think about how we target action to uh, increase climate uh, resilience. It, we've used a national grid model, 200 meter grid, and put all the data into that to allow us to carry out the analysis over a series of metrics. I'm going to show you some very briefly show you the maps of these metrics. We look at habitat sensitivity to climate change of direct impacts looking at habitat fragmentation again, topographic heterogeneity and current management and condition. And we've used a direction of travel, hotter, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, and not really focused on specific climate change scenarios. And we create maps to you know, help us think and, and uh, discuss what's going on in the landscape with uh, regard to climate change. And there's a tool, again, we've created a tool, a framework to allow us to update things and use different data as we go. This is what it looks like. These are the metrics on the side. We've got that kind of exposure metric and sensitivity. Then we've got these adaptive capacity metrics, what give the habitats um, resilience to climate change. And they come together to create vulnerability. Um, and that's where I'm gonna show you today. There's also a metric that looks at conservation value. One of the biodiversity principles, you know, look after your best stuff, but that would be a prioritization action. And to quickly just run through some maps here, so this is a, the sensitivity um, analysis. So we've given it a, lo a low, medium, high score, and it's relative sensitivity to climate change, not, you know, not, not that low sensitivity means no sensitivity. But it shows us, um, you know, picks out some of those most sensitive habitats, and often these are at the coast due to sea level rise or uh, mountainous habitats as well. This is habitat fragmentation. Uh, and this, I should say, is all priority habitats in one map, and we're looking at the uh, most vulnerable habitat overall that's given the score in the square here. The, basically, the bit large yellow areas are large habitat patches, and the smaller red areas, orange areas, are the small fragmented pieces. We look at two different submetrics here. We look at the habitat aggregation, which is like patch size, and then landscape matrix, which is that kind of friendly habitat around the, um, 
around the, uh, the, the single habitat itself. So we're trying to say something about the permeability as well as the hatch size in the landscape. We also look at topographic heterogeneity because um, it just inherently something flat and low lying is more vulnerable to change than something lumpy and bumpy with a range of different uh, options for movement or niches. We'll come on to that a little bit later as well. And we look at management and condition. This is just a yes, no score. And uh, I won't be able to go into the complexities of, that underlie this, but we're looking for stuff that's happening on the ground that is either a management plan or action or agri-environment scheme or some information here that um, says that there's some management going on in relation to biodiversity habitat uh, in, on the ground. Um, and this is one that often gets people speaking. And quite often that's what we want with maps. We want that decision support tool. We want people to get discussing about what's going on in their local area. We have the option to bring it, the tool brings all these together and gives you an overall vulnerability uh, score. I must say that in over the time since development, we really found the use of the individual metrics more informative and more useful, um, but it's still possible to sort of give that uh, added up score. So now here we're looking at uh, the red and orange areas. They're the places that have, um, you know, the, the, the main, the, the lower scores when it comes to the vulnerability assessment here. So the yellow end of the spectrum is looking fairly good. And you would create different actions with these different places. So you look after the stuff that's potentially doing well, and we need to think about what action we need to take for the stuff that's not so resilient. And just to show that we can, uh, we do this in, we can have different groupings of habitats or we can have individual habitats. Uh, these, these are examples of individual habitats and this is the tool that we've created um, in order to uh, be able to run things again and try new things. There's an awful lot of flexibility in here in terms of how we group habitats together or the weighting in the scores. So we really, um, yeah, may, we're very keen to make sure that we have these abilities, you know, to rerun things and share with partners as well. Um, we've got lots of other things too. Um, this is a uh, is what's called our Species Risks and Opportunities Project. There's a big report that I'm sure we'll be sharing the link with you um, that looks at how species are going to respond to climate change. And part of the project was to create climate envelope modeling. And so we've got th over 3000 species looking at how they are modeled against their current climate and then looking at how that will change in the future and then seeing whether they're modeled to lose or gain uh, climate space. And so it's interesting to see that on its own, but it has no relation to any habitat on the ground. So then we start, then I, we, you know, we start to think about how we might use that with other tools. And it's possible, I think we're going to explore how we might use the uh, change in climate space model here to influence the, the, the start point and the end point for runs like Condata. So where over a landscape, where over a, a, you know, a large spatial area, other species projected to currently be and, and where they are in the future. So that might inform some of our thinking within uh, the use of Condatis. I mentioned coming back on to topography. Uh, very briefly here, we've been working a little bit on climate change refugia, you know, where things either have uh, areas that are buffered from climate change in the surroundings. So they might have a favorable climate, they might have a slower climate warming, they might have a range of different topography that keeps land uh, cooler or damper, has those kind of component parts that allow species to hang on, you know, where these refugia may be. It's kind of a, a moving on a little bit and being a bit more specific about um, refugia from the topography metric in the vulnerability assessment. So it's just, you know, where might things hang on and where we, we, it's really good to know where they are. And then also thinking about how this comes together with other things, perhaps like Condatis and habitat network mapping to see whether species will be able to move between refugia or whether they're completely cut off and how we might facilitate that movement. So as I've said- Five, five minutes, please, Sarah. Great. As I've said, um, we're working on how to bring these things together. Um, I've mentioned a couple of those ideas and we've started work on them. So this is, hopefully you'll remember, this is the uh, National Habitat Network map. You can see the the area, the expansion zone there is now um, all different colors of red. 
And that's because we've run the topography metric from the adaptation manual, uh, sorry, topography metric from the vulnerability tool over the expansion zone to look where the range of topographic heterogeneity is. So the most variable is in the high dark red areas. And it might be that we want to create habitat in those more varied areas, you know, draw out if the possibility is there. So the soils are there to support this habitat, as we can tell by the expansion zone, we might want to take the opportunities to create that habitat, if possible, over a range of topography rather than in the flatter areas. We've also, I'll come on to a um, resource that we've just published, which is our carbon storage and sequestration report by Habitat. This is a complete mock-up, this isn't any data at all, but this is uh, an attempt to say we might be able to utilise uh, that the figures in that data to say where we might have the greatest impact on if we created habitat on habitat storage and sequestration over the habitat network um, expansion zone and enhancement zones. So where we'll hit, get the most carbon storage and sequestration in our proposed network. And it's really important, of course, we all um, know how important it is to bring these things, these tools and decision support tools together with local knowledge and experience. Um, and you know that's absolutely vital, interpreting this stuff because all data is wrong, um, but just some things are more useful than others. Uh, some kind of, that's a mangled quote, but you know what I mean? Making sure that we use those, um, that knowledge of local opportunities, constraints uh, to interpret this stuff is, is vital. And it's really important that we use frameworks that help us uh, use both uh, spatial data and local knowledge, as well as other evidence. And we have been working a bit on doing that as well. So our, um, we published last year our second edition of our climate change adaptation manual with the RSPB. There's a huge amount of information in here um, about climate change adaptation, uh, lots of detailed stuff on habitats and species and different thematic sections. But what we've included in this new um, version is a landscape scale climate change assessment method and it's a series of questions just fairly simple questions that helped walk people through how to assess what's going on with climate change in their landscape but we've got a place where we draw in this spatial data so it's trying to uh, identify the large picture but draw in some of the, uh, the spatial data that we might use to help answer these questions. We've also got our nature networks evidence handbook um, really expanding on a lot of the principles that was raised by Lawton, uh, identifying again these spatial data and tools, but as has been already mentioned, making sure that uh, the wide range of beneficiaries, including people, of course, uh, the users of nature networks and the beneficiaries of the nature-based solutions are you know, key and central to any design. Um, so these are things that I'll have to let you go and have a look at and, and go through, but they're it's these are places where we've collated and brought together the thinking that we've been doing over many years, clearly with a huge range of contributors and um, authors and partners. This is the carbon storage and sequestration by Habitat report that I mentioned, only published on the 20th of April, so brand new, hot off the press. It's a real huge repository of those figures for um, habitats and how they store and sequester carbon. So hopefully really useful at the moment with uh, thankfully, climate change ri rising up the agenda. And there's a range of other resources that we have. We really have been with everybody on the call and, and various partners. We've been working on this for a long time. And yeah, hopefully we can uh, use this stuff to make a big difference, um, drawing together that range of evidence and underpinning data with these sort of spatial representations of that as well. So yeah, in conclusion, I think you know it's, it's clear that we don't have all the answers just yet um, to this stuff and, and maybe we won't ever, but we're asking a lot of the right questions. We've got these principles that we're drawing together to help us make these decisions. And, and clearly, you know, we know that spatial data can't help us provide all the answers to that, but I think there can be lots of useful insights and, um, and, and areas that can be highlighted that we might want to investigate further. Um, and they can help us visualize things, get discussions going and, and maybe prioritize some action as well. Hopefully, you know, we think we've uh, developed some good tools and data that will help. And we have worked in partnership to do this. So and that's you know, clearly really, really important. And as I've said, we're working on how we combine those data sets to make them more useful. 
not to obscure things or hide things, but just to make sure that um, we're utilizing any benefits from crossing over with those data sets. And hopefully you'll also find some of those resources, the adaptation manual, the Nature Networks handbook, the carbon storage report, uh, useful in terms of guidance and um, setting out some of the evidence. Um, we are using these things. Uh, we've mentioned the Our Nature Recovery Network, Our Nature Recovery Network partnership, drawing people together to talk about this. We're hoping that these tools will form a, you know, a good part of our nature recovery network toolkit as well. So they'll be provided to people for them to use. And we're also working on um, the local nature recovery strategy pilot areas as well and sharing this data with them. And we'll learn some valuable lessons, I'm sure, from uh, that work. So yeah, partnership working is very important as we know. Climate change adaptation, mitigation, nature-based solutions, and multifunctionality to provide everything we need from uh, the nature recovery networks to the all the beings that need them. You know that has to be very central to um, the design of the NRN. But probably most importantly, I think we need to get on and deliver stuff, put it on the ground as well. We've got lots of pieces of paper and lots of maps, and that's that's really great to help us guide our thinking. But it's it's absolutely crucial and absolutely urgent that we get nature recovery on the ground. So hopefully all this um, thinking and planning and talking can lead us to that point. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sarah. I think that was hugely complex, um, but at the same time, it was really exciting just to see all of that being visualized and just to kind of showcase I guess the complexity um, of dealing with, you know, the environment on the whole, but you know, the kind of complexity that comes into thinking when it when we when we're talking about nature recovery networks and you know the I guess the different layers of, of work that you've conducted that kind of get added on to kind of the habitat network that you touched upon um, um, at, at the beginning. And I think it's it's very useful for us to get that perspective of what's happening um, geographically quite close to us, but still at a national level and, you know, what the outputs of that sort of work could look like. Um, so it will also be really interesting then to uh, hear from, from the likes of, of Ian and Kate later on when we look at first Northern Ireland, but then more locally um, when we talk to Kate as well and how that local knowledge really can feed into to all of this. So I think it was very useful, in fact, to have you, I guess, here at the beginning. Um, uh, so thank you very, very much for that. And we're really looking forward to asking you all sorts of questions later on. Um, I can already see plenty uh, coming through. So, so beware. I'll get my thinking cap on. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I guess we'll just next um, jump on to, to Ian before we have um, a quick break. So um, oh, it's great that we have actually input to our webinar series from Northern Ireland today. So our next presenter will be Ian Davies. Ian uh, works at the uh, Northern Ireland Environment Agency and more specifically, he is the evidence team leader for the Natural um, Environment Department. Um, or at the Natural Environment Department. Um, he has been working with his team on quite an exciting and um, may I say cutting edge uh, remote sensing mapping exercise, uh, which he will be telling us uh, about shortly. Uh, it will be quite nice to get an, an example, I guess, for us happening here in Northern Ireland and to discuss really how these sort of pieces of work could potentially contribute towards the NRN work. So an example of just what Sarah has talked about uh, of an individual piece of work that then can contribute towards that NRN design. Um, so I'm sure uh, many of us will find this um, a very interesting topic and a lovely, I guess, update on a piece of work more locally for us. Um, so thank you very, very much, uh, Ian, for taking the time to, to, to present today. Uh, the floor is yours whenever you are ready.
Hi there. Can you hear me okay? You are quite quiet, but I can still hear you. I'm not sure whether you might be quite far away from the mic. Okay. Can you hear me now? Better, yes. Okay, great. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction, uh, Nina. Um, so yes, um, I'm Ian Davies from uh, Northern Ireland Environment Agency, Natural Environment Division. Uh, we're head of a small uh, evidence team. Um, and we have a particular focus on spatial data. Um, so it's very appropriate uh, this meeting. Spatial data, the spatial arena uh, is essentially becoming the arena where a lot of um, analytics and modeling and design, nature recovery, and network framework um, design is being built out. And we've, you've obviously seen that through, through the morning and through previous um, events. And um, so yes, the, the gathering of quality digital and um, spatial information on uh, habitats is, is, is something that uh, is central to our work and I, my team's work. And uh, uh, certainly in uh, Northern Environment Agency and uh, our key partners, we have access to a wealth of significant, uh, important habitat field survey information. Um, our protected areas uh, for which we have a statutory conservation protection uh, and reporting rule have uh, good overall um, um, sort of currency uh, in terms of uh, recent habitat surveys. We have ongoing programs, um, uh, sort of six year cycles for our protected areas, ASSIs, um, and we've got uh, an ongoing initiative in particular around special areas of conservation, uh, part of the Emerald Network, um, which is more of a focus. Um, and there's a uh, great detail being developed uh, within a program of uh, conservation management plans and habitat maps being developed at very high detail. Annex one features being identified, uh, national vegetation classification being mapped out. And that's got very much a sort of a field-based uh, focus um, and, you know, Field-based um, surveying still is the gold standard um, for habitat mapping. Um, and whilst it is excellent that we have this information uh, continually growing around our protected areas, um, in terms of our responsibility and our certainly uh, data repository for um, those areas, those priority habitat areas outside of protected areas, we do have a significant repository. But uh, some of that data is now of an age and um, you know, a key data set or PECAN data set was really last comprehensively surveyed back in the late 80s and 90s um, uh, conducted through uh, persons uh, Crookshank and Thomason. And that still is very well respected data set, but clearly time and events management has changed over those intervening 20 to 30 years. So there is a call for um, updating and, and, and new information. And also uh, we've got uh, a lot of international local um, commitments, biodiversity strategies, international commitments, net zero, Paris Agreement, um, conservation um, uh, objectives, uh, Co Convention for uh, Biological Diversity, 30, 30 commitments, 30% uh, of our area um, Protected for conservation by 2030. These are these are big targets, and certainly um, the setting within a nature recovery network, coherent uh, network, uh, can certainly uh, play an important and intelligent role in creating a spatial framework uh, where many of these goals can be met. So uh, the ideal scenario would be that we would all have fingertip access to the most current standardized um, habitat information across all of Northern Ireland in near real time. Uh, and whilst the groundfield survey at regional level would be um, ideal, um, it's hugely expensive both in terms of uh, resource but time as well. Uh, for example, Wales um, have had conducted a full phase one habitat survey of the country, very impressive. But in terms of time, that took roughly uh, 20 years to complete. And, um, you know, there's a lot of change in that intervening um, sort of time. Ian, can I just ask quickly um, whether you had planned to move on from the first slide yet or just okay. wanted to check that, that the presentation is working, basically? Indeed. So, um, oh, yeah, so yeah. here... So here, so here we are. Um, so satellite uh, data has been uh, extensively used to provide um, a synoptic view of the land, the land use, land cover. Um, we've got uh, various land cover series, CH, excellent. 
And whilst there is some crossover between the land cover types and habitats, um, the, the, the latter does not specifically follow a classification scheme uh, to delineate uh, those habitats of key interest. Um, and, uh, you know, traditionally high resolution satellite data um, has, has accessibility has been a, a limiting factor. And so a lot of products um, that have been developed through remote sensing have been um, relatively coarse in nature and haven't maybe delineated those key priority habitats that we are interested in. However, over the last sort of five years, really, the, the entry of the EU Copernicus program into the market has been an absolute game changer in the provision of free and open satellite data of really high resolution as well to government and public users. Um, and then also on the back of that, the establishment of what we call analysis ready data um, through transformation and correction of the raw data and imagery um, helps provide a standardized series of products that the, the end user, the analyst can then start to employ with confidence that there is an actual um, set standard that has been employed to clean and transform that data for desktop use. Um, and there are technical challenges that now have been overcome and certainly um, Northern Ireland with Joint Nature um, Conservation Committee and Scottish Government, we've developed an analysis ready data um, uh, initiative whereby all of the Copernicus Programme Sentinel data, these are the names of the satellites, um, are being um, basically transformed, cleaned and uh, corrected on a weekly basis. Uh, and they are being stored in um, uh, a NERC funded institution, the Centre of Environmental Data Analysis called CEDA, and that's processed through supercomputers called Jasmine. And uh, at the moment, we've got a 14 month archive there that anybody can access and get uh, access and use that analysis ready data. So I would certainly encourage people to do that, and we'll maybe send links to that later. Um, but a key entry um, in terms of analysing that data for use in uh, habitat mapping, land cover features, um, has been developed through Natural England. Um, and this is a statistical code based method, uh, which enables users to implement a uh, machine learning um, approach to habitat classification. And this is uh, called the living maps uh, method. And it is a statistical probability based uh, prediction um, of that likely habitat type based on known values and characteristics that are employed within the algorithm. Um, so essentially, um, this uh, has allowed um, Northern Ireland to engage with um, key people. And we've, we've set up, a, initially it was a pilot project, now it's a full on project with JNCC, who you mentioned earlier, um, utilizing this method developed by Natural England to see how it could play out um, within Northern Ireland in terms of giving us information on unknown areas or areas where we think we need to have updated um, habitat data information across Northern Ireland and doing it in a consistent methodology uh, that we can all follow and, and understand the logic. Um, so um, referring to some of the satellite information that is used, the Copernicus program, as I say, is key and central to this. There are two main satellites uh, that produce data and imagery that are central to this living maps approach. And Sentinel-2 um, satellite is probably the fundamentally most important. Um, this is uh, a polar orbital um, satellite. It's a pair of satellites um, that cross uh, the Earth in polar, polar orbit. And we in Northern Ireland will have a weekly, approximately uh, refresh coverage as this swathe, which is around 290 kilometers, passes across uh, Northern Ireland as on a weekly basis. Um, it achieves uh, around 10 meter resolution. We have to do um, a bit of work with uh, our partners to um, uh, reprocess some of the, the, the wave bands so that we have a consistent. Uh, 10 meter multi-spectral series of bands. And there are 10 bands that we actually use. There's 13 bands in, in total that come from the satellite. Three are used for atmospheric correction and then 10 are used specifically within a characterizing habitat type. And this ranges from the visible wave bands through to red edge, near infrared, and then the short wave infrared bands. And the 
spectral signature values real world features, habitats of interest, and um, they um, they will all um, have, as I said, values uh, that are based on reflection, reflectance and absorption uh, qualities within different these different portions portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so, for example. Uh, very productive, uh, improved grassland vegetation will absorb a lot of energy in the red and blue bands, but it will also strongly reflect in green and near infrared bands. And these signatures can be built up across all um, different types of vegetation, essentially chlorophyll containing vegetation, but also um, looking at other structures, exposed rock, etc. We can build up this almost like signature library of values. Um, water strongly absorbs energy in the near infrared uh, band and the shortwave infrared band at the furthest end of uh, the spectrum that we have available uh, is sensitive to uh, moisture content in the soil and vegetation. And that is important when we're looking at those very sort of wet um, habitat types, particularly around peatland, uh, that we have this extra band that helps characterize and uh, differentiate uh, in habitat type. And this is a bit of the European Space Agency's um, uh, graphic on um, the Sentinel-2 satellite itself and just the volume of products, 20 million products uh, produced at that point in time. And it's, let's say, delivering since 2015. So we are building up this back catalog of data as well that can be used for further refinement methodology and hand casting going forward if we're looking at trend analysis in the future. Um, the second major satellite that we're using uh, in this uh, cohort of, of data is um, called uh, Sentinel-1 and it is um, basically radar, synthetic aperture radar. And again, that's a fully processed set of data and imagery uh, that we have available. And essentially it's active pulses of uh, energy uh, in the form of radio waves and um, that are sent to the Earth's surface. And then a signal, energy signal uh, intensity is returned and captured by the sensors on the satellite. And depending on the, the nature um, of the surface that uh, these active pulses are hitting, there's a whole variety of what we call backscatter that is being measured. Uh, and if, depending on the surface roughness, um, there's a difference in um, the, the scattering um, of um, the energy uh, and how that actually is then picked up and measured by um, the sensors on uh, the Sentinel-1 satellite help characterize um, and add extra um, characteristics to that habitat type. So for example, on a, on a an even grassland area, uh, there's more what we call spectral scattering um, of energy, and it's more uniform. Whereas on um, slightly rougher, woodier um, species um, around heathland, um, there's much more diffuse scattering of, uh, of that energy, and all of that helps build up an extra picture on those particular habitat um, types. And um, importantly, um, we have discovered um, that the use of ancillary data is also very important um, to, to what we're actually trying to do in terms of characterizing um, these, um, these different habitat types. And so building a stack of additional uh, information uh, associated with the space in which the habitats and features uh, that we're interested in exist um, helps us define and delineate um, those different habitats better. Um, certainly heterogeneity um, in semi-natural habitat vegetation um, is, is, is our big test area. Um, and so having this extra cohort of stack of data um, certainly will help um, us differentiate how they actually exist. So we've got climatic data, uh, precipitation, rainfall, temperature. Uh, we've got geology data in terms of drift geology and soils. And um, we certainly know from a geological point of view, there's an absolute correlation between limestone, say, and calcareous grasslands. They exist hand in hand. Um, bedrock type as well, fundamental uh, underpinning um, data set. And then digital terrain, very important. Height, slope, and uh, contouring. Certain habitat types will exist in certain um, sort of height or 
slope, steepness of slope type range, and that helps build the picture when we're trying to assign um, char known characteristics of habitats to unknown areas, but they have this set of statistical values built in them. I'll go into that in a bit more detail. An ordnance survey as well, place where something is actually located, its closeness, proximity to coast, roads, built structures, all these things have influence uh, when we're trying to actually create a definition of type and characteristic values for each of these sort of habitat um, types that we're trying to differentiate. Um, and then of course, training data itself. So this is, this is critical. Um, so uh, once we've actually established um, all of these different characteristics on a, an XY coordinate piece of ground, uh, in terms of uh, reflectance absorption within multispectral bands, surface roughness within um, the uh, radar imagery, and then association with soil, geology, slope, um, height, precipitation, and um, all of that has to actually have a habitat name, a type and identity, and that's where training data is essential. Um, and we have to supply quite a, a large amount of uh, training data uh, at a consistent um, sort of level for each habitat type that we're interested in. And, um, uh, and, and again, it has to be spatially accurate as well. Um, so we're fortunate that we do have access to quite a lot of monitoring data and it's a growing um, data set um, with good sub-meter accuracy um, GPS positioning um, so that we can actually um, gather um, information on those habitats uh, at a very precise location and help then build that as training data package um, into this, um, uh, let's say, this machine learning algorithm process. Um, it's been from a variety of sources. We have our own, as I say, monitoring program where we can gather data, but also um, some uh, colleagues within Forest Service and within our own department, uh, food and farming in terms of arable uh, crop data as well. We've managed to get a good resource there. Plus also uh, where we're maybe um, looking at some uh, previous um, surveys, so such as the Northern Ireland Countryside Survey, we're able to get some very valuable uh, information and have that verified and checked. And that's key, making sure that it is quality representation of that type that we're putting forward. And um, so we don't want uh, necessarily unfavorable um, condition uh, habitats, which essentially could have contamination from other um, vegetation or invasive uh, coming in that don't necessarily represent the ideal of how that habitat should be represented. There was quite a bit of work there in terms of getting that together and we've spent quite a bit of time on this over this last year really when we've uh, started taking this from pilot project through to something potentially operational. Um, so this is actually now I'm just looking at the, uh, the Natural England uh, classification method for living maps which we are employing uh, in Northern Ireland and um, it uses the R statistical package um, and uh, the first stage is what we call segmentation. So that's based on the Sentinel-2 imagery where um, based on um, reflections and absorption within all of these pixels, um, similar values um, of neighboring pixels are essentially coalesced together and there's segmented objects of like uh, areas objects um, uh, that are then essentially extrapolated through um, a software program. And uh, then we employ all of the data stack that we referred earlier. So Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 uh, imagery, plus all of the ancillary spatial data um, are then employed against those segmented areas. And uh, we then calculate zonal statistics for um, each of those segmented areas or polygons. And for the whole of Northern Ireland, we have run it as a test and we're roughly around probably one and a half million uh, polygons uh, that essentially have to have zone statistics calculated for them. So it's a big computer exercise. Um, there's an element around missing value, so I probably should have touched on that with Sentinel too. Um, 
with the best intentions, and that's why it's so good that we do have um, weekly refresh of satellite imagery because cloud is such a problem uh, in Northern Ireland, particularly in the west of the country. Um, getting a clear image over even four or five weeks can virtually be impossible at times. So having this weekly refresh does allow us to achieve um, clarity, but there are still occasions where there are small areas of cloud and, and uh, potentially we do have to look at uh, how we would impute missing values based on statistics of nearest neighbor cells. Um, so the, the extracted zonal statistics uh, from the training data um, are also calculated uh, and they are calculated where that training data GPS point sits within its own segmented polygon and they are then associated with that habitat type. Um, so uh, we basically then employ um, some of the, the what we call training data into the program some is set aside for um, ground truthing and um, there's a weighting that occurs uh, as we run this through what we call a random forest um, algorithm. And it's not forestry, it's called random forest because essentially it uses decision trees, uh, which fire out um, looking at different key variables and returning back um, a probability prediction on what that habitat in an unknown area is likely to be. So in one of these segmented polygons, uh, which has similar characteristics uh, to a polygon where we utilize training data, then prediction on what habitat type is, is then delivered. And then finally, there is this calculator user producer accuracy um, assessment. This is an error matrix where we look at where the, the accuracies are very high or where there's been overestimation, underestimation in a particular habitat type. Uh, and that might require reiteration of the program to try and refine that. Um, so essentially then the end result is output data that is converted into a vector shape file, as you all know, uh, within um, uh, that can be utilized within a standard GIS environment. And you can see that endpoint there. And this has been a test area that we have uh, been heavily focused on, mainly because of its complexity for MAMA in terms of semi-natural habitats. Um, and so this has been um, our mainstay and, and where we, we are at the moment. And I will just run through um, a bit of what I discussed earlier. So this is um, showing uh, an image of um, a normal ordnance survey aerial image of a part of Quilka in West Fermanagh, Quilka Mountain, um, SAC. And uh, then the next image is um, Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. And you can see that there is very much uh, quite a, a clear um, um, match there. And even though it's a much coarser resolution in terms of um, 10 meter pixels as opposed to 25 centimeter, you can still see even visually um, that this is a, a good match. And so this is employed. Um, and then all of the, as I say, pixels that have similar characteristic reflectance absorption values are then segmented. Uh, and this is a segmented design over this portion of Quail Command. And you can see the complexity there. A lot of those uh, pixels um, uh, are formed into very small and um, segmented areas. And uh, we then need to uh, see uh, how we actually employ through the algorithm, uh, understanding what the habitat values are likely to be on each segment. Um, this is just showing um, a, a bit of um, how we've employed some of the ancillary data. So this is showing the the digital terrain model, it's borne out in uh, contour mapping, but it shows the range of height, slope, plateau there, and also then uh, the training data that exists in this particular area. So it's mainly blanket bog and wet heath points uh, that you can see there. And um, onto the Five next- Five minutes, please, Ian. Okay, onto the next slide. Uh, you can see that essentially um, there is this core relationship once the map has been actually extrapolated, the habitat types you can see, which is very pleasing to see, wet heat on the steeper slopes and blanket bog on the higher, um, uh, more uh, gentle sloping plateaus. So that's good correlation. Um, final, moving on, uh, just a bit of detail on the actual habitat types that we've been able to pull out so far in uh, Fermanagh at the moment. And you can see the NBC classes that have been aggregated together um, to um, 
four uh, broader habitat class names uh, on the left. And this is still work in progress and there are other types, as I mentioned, arable um, crop mapping, uh, felled woodland, um, that we will uh, be moving on and certainly once we move into other um, counties as well. Um, and of course, brown truthing, mentioned that earlier, that's absolutely key and central. Uh, we've used so much of our data as training data that we do need to acquire more information and data for ground truthing. And this will happen over the next year. We've been a bit slowed down through uh, the whole uh, pandemic. But uh, we feel a combined use of um, in situ field, traditional conventional field uh, surveys plus drone surveys will certainly help us build that picture. And so that error matrix um, validation process will occur probably later in the year. Um, just talking about the integration of this uh, product, traditionally we have used ordnance survey mapping, ortho aerial um, mapping from uh, ordnance survey and soils and other data sets to help us have that understanding from the desktop as to what is going on out there in the environment. But now building in uh, this uh, potential habitat mapping product uh, in virtual near real time is certainly um, something that will be part of this integrated product or that's our plan anyway uh, going forward. Um, just the next step here is, um, this is how we plan to tackle um, what will be fairly daunting, um, moving from just a Fermanagh pilot to the whole of Northern Ireland based on four major zones. And those major zones have been worked on through um, uh, a lot of uh, collaboration with our own earth scientists in NIA, uh, our earth science team. And uh, we've managed to, on the basis of broad bedrock underpinning uh, established the zones so that we can then uh, look at the floristic characteristics of habitats in, large, in sections rather than the whole of Northern Ireland. And that has been important uh, with other uh, similar projects in the past to have these sort of sections broken down to allow this to take place. Um, and then finally, what I would say is with any innovation challenge, um, there's there's always um, even your own and um, uh, managing your own expectations of what can happen or what problems you may encounter. And uh, I'm sure you've seen this before, the, the, the statistical hype cycle, but it's, it certainly um, gives gives a good um, um, sort of, uh, yeah, graph of uh, how, how, how technology and innovation uh, proceeds through to eventually um, having an achievement of a productive outcome and a series of outputs that uh, are, are of use and of, of value. And yes, to some extent, yeah, we, we've, we've been through there. I think we're in an enlightenment mode at the moment. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, I, I think this last graph is, is very, very relevant to, to us when we have conversations about nature recovery networks as well on the whole. So I do hope that, um, I guess it's, it's important for us to, to explore, you know, what this sort of innovation could mean for, let's say like the likes of, of, of the work that we're working on, on nature recovery networks and how something like this, which has obvious perks in terms of, um, you know, like you say, just how often it's repeated and then combining that as well um, with that local know-how and that ground truth in, then it would be interesting to, to explore if we could somehow, you know, fit this into the whole, whole thinking around nature recovery networks. And also when it comes to, I guess, um, monitoring that change over time as well, if you're talking about actual delivery. Um, so maybe we can have our own innovation graph when it comes to thinking about the living maps on Northern Ireland uh, within the nature recovery networks um, uh, thinking. So hopefully we can have our own slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity within that uh, going forward as well. So thank you very, very much for, um, for that. I think that was very interesting and more than anything, I think thank you for making that content so so accessible for us, I guess, lay people when it comes to, you know, remote sensing and, you know, teaching computers and so on. 
Um, and I think it's especially fantastic for us here today to have that um, breadth of, I guess, approaches as well when it comes to monitoring and, um, and mapping and how that all could, you know, together then play this role of producing uh, outputs that are going to be really fit for purpose. So I think it was very interesting to have this more, um, I guess, well, remote, because it's remote sensing sort of aspect feeding into this and then following this up later on after our break to, to hear from, from, from Kate and especially that role of, of on the ground work and, and stakeholder engagement. So I think that will be very, very interesting. So thank you very, very much for that, Ian. Um, we are, would you mind stopping um, the, the sharing of your screen? Great, thanks. So we are a little bit behind um, our schedule, which I guess uh, was to be expected. Um, so I've reduced our break time to 10 minutes from the, the original 15 minutes. So yes, let's all of us have um, a little bit of a break and make sure we can have refreshed sources of caffeine for the latter half of today. So if I could ask us all to be back at 10 past 11. Um, and if you could put that time into the chat as well, Laura and Monica. Um, so let's all be back at 10 past 11. And then we shall have one more talk from Kate. And then we have 45 minutes for Q&A. Yes, so welcome back everybody. Um, I put up the next Slido on the screen already just so we can start um, making our responses. Uh, so obviously we've been talking about data quite a bit. Um, we're talking about mapping in terms of modeling and remote sensing, um, but also um, it's worthwhile for us to um, do our thinking when it comes to where, where we have um, potential constraints, whether this come to, they come to data access, um, data use or sharing, or just the fact that um, we are not considering the right data sets. So um, uh, I think it's very interesting, yeah, data licensing, data availability, quality, um, yeah, it would be really interesting to see your views on this, because obviously when it comes to designing um, our approach and our own maps as well, we need to be aware of not just about the potential and opportunities, but also the potential constraints and, and risks as part of that process. So I'll leave this up for a few moments and then we'll move on to our last speaker. quite a few comments on data quality and availability, but also when it comes to, you know, competing um, interests and also when it comes to quality and avail availability is, you know, that long-term funding. Um, but also when we have actual data at our hands, you know, availability of using it, but also having that expertise. And I think that is a very, very good point. We need to build that expertise for all of this in Northern Ireland as well, especially if we want to, you know, actually make that impact. There was a very good comment coming through how to measure impact, success if, if, if implemented, and all of that comes into monitoring and, and tracking that, that change, but at the same time having that that expertise to make sure that it's done in the most appropriate way. Trying 
transparency is a good one too. We'll just give that one more moment in case people were still brewing their, their drinks and then we'll move on to, to Kate's talk. quite nice to see these sort of uh, points being shown on the screen, um, especially in relation to what we've talked about already, but also those questions that have come through in the Q&A. You know, there's a question about updates and how often, and that will in fact be our, our next slider question. So something to keep, keep in mind. Yeah, that importance of political will is obviously key. We need to all work on this together. Right, I think we will move on. I shall leave this up on the screen for a few more moments while I, while I introduce us all to our um, last speaker of the day, by no means the, the least. Um, so our last speaker um, today is Kate Fuller and she will be tuning in from central Scotland. Kate has been around the um, Upper Firth of Forth since 2012, previously having been the project officer with the Inner Forth Landscape Initiative. And now she's the product manager for Inner Forth Futures. Uh, Kate holds an MSc uh, in conservation from the uh, UCL and has volunteered and worked with a range of ENGOs in the environmental sector for the last 14 years, uh, located in Greater Manchester, North Wales, Hampshire, and the west of Scotland. Her previous in, uh, experience uh, includes environmental education, community engagement with pre pure, pure urban green space, project development and delivery to realize benefits for landscape people and heritage. So again, highlighting that, um, that myriad of, of interests and, and uh, benefits that these sort of work can, can deliver. So please, Kate, I shall stop um, sharing my screen and leave the floor for you. Thank you very much, Nina. Um, and good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to be able to join you here today. Um, just going to check that I'm sharing the correct screen before we get started. Super. Um, looking good. Looking good. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Um, so, oh, no, I think. Is that still looking good? Um, we can see it's not on the presenter mode now, I think. Now it is. Okay, so you can just see my first slide there. Yes. Perfect. That's exactly what I was hoping that you'd be able to see. Well, great. Um, thank you for uh, that great introduction. Um, and um, really pleased to be with you today. So um, as Nina mentioned, um, I work for the uh, Inner Forth Futures Partnership um, and uh, we're a group of nine organisations that are based around the Upper Firth of Forth in central Scotland. Um, we are led by the RSPB, um, but we also include Stirling, Falkirk, Fife, uh, and Clackmallinshire Cl local authorities, Central Scotland Green Network uh, Trust. Well, they've rebranded in the last 12 months as Green Action Trust, uh, Historic Environment Scotland, Nature Scott and Sustrans. Um, and when we talk about uh, the area that we work in, we say it's the, the inner fourth. Um, it's a bit of a construct, really. Um, for those of you who aren't too familiar with central Scotland, uh, if you roughly drew a kind of lozenge shape in between uh, Edinburgh and Stirling, um, 
that's shifted it slightly west of the fourth bridges, you'd pretty much capture where we work. Um, it's quite a diverse area and I'll show you a few pictures of that area in just a moment. But our partnership works together um, and has worked together since about 2012 uh, based around three core principles. We want to try and raise awareness of heritage around the fourth, um, not just for the people who work there and live there, but also to um, kind of enhance the area for those who visit and invest in it as well. We want to try and support communities to have a greater role in the management and promotion of that heritage. So we're talking about natural, built and cultural heritage. And we also want to try and pilot approaches to delivering habitat networks and climate adaptation. And um, so that's really where some of the work that I'm going to be talking to you today fits in quite neatly. But the inner fourth area, um, for those of you who've been fantastic, for those of you who uh, perhaps don't know the area so well, here's a few slides. Um, it's a really important area for wildlife. We have a Ramsar site around the upper Firth of Forth, so that international wetland designation. We have a special area of conservation, SPA, lots of triple SIs, um, and lots of it is really focused on the overwintering wildfowl and waders, um, which at this time of year are just starting to disappear. And this sort of uh, multi-layered uh, area of designation and the importance of the area for bird life in particular um, was the starting point of our partnership and is what led RSPB to look for opportunities to try and work in partnership with others. It's also a pretty accessible landscape. There's a huge amount of industry going on. We've got Grangemouth, the petrochemical works, um, there's uh, the MOD sites over at um, uh, Recife where we have Babcock as well. Um, and we have Diageo, um, as the dr drinks folks up in Alloa. Uh, we're crisscrossed with lots of communications networks, whether it's road and rail or um, uh, sort of pylons. Um, so there's a lot of sort of people impact in the landscape as well. And at the centre of it all is this really dynamic river, which has wandered and winded around the landscape and changes over time. Um, in Scotland, the sea walls are the responsibility of the landowner. Um, I'm not too sure what the situation is in Northern Ireland, I'm afraid, but certainly I know it's quite different to in England. So there's that um, interest of sort of a, a dynamic landscape and how that uh, sort of rise and fall of uh, the river and potential future impacts of climate change may have an impact on the land as well. Um, around the fourth, we've got lovely meadows, lots of interesting different types of uh, uh, sort of peatland and wetland habitats, um, and plenty of uh, fantastic woodlands as well. And great views when you get up onto the sort of raised beach scarp, when you can look down onto the fourth. And because of that wealth of natural heritage, we've also got a really interesting mix of built heritage. Um, it's not all visible. There's a huge amount under the ground um, that you can't see either. Uh, but that really draws um, people to the area. And um, these sort of buildings that we have left in the landscape uh, really uh, show the kind of rise and fall of different communities. And it's also a fantastic place to get out and explore. We have a great network of walking and cycling networks. Um, and it's in easy reach of Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, which, as you can imagine, means that actually we have a really busy landscape at times as well. So there's that mix of people and wildlife in quite a small area. And as a partnership, um, we've previously uh, worked at this landscape scale through a large lottery grant. Um, and part of that work through the Inner Force Landscape Initiative was around creating and enhancing uh, uh, some of the wetland, uh, woodland, brownfield sites that we have around the area. And it's that work that we were carrying out in partnership with other agencies um, that uh, brought us into contact with uh, another project and a project that was called EcoCo Life. And you may be aware of the, the life pot of funding uh, from the, the EU um, and Ecoco Life um, were working across the whole of central Scotland um, at the same time frame as we were working there between about 2014 and 2018. And the Ecoco Life project was run by um, Scottish Natural Heritage, as was Nature Scott Now, um, another partnership project. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, for those of you who uh, look for opportunities to fund your work, um, some of the work that we delivered through the Inner Forth Landscape Initiative on a selection of wetland sites was also part of the Ecoco Life project. Um, we uh, match funded each other. We had very similar objectives. Um, and again, it's that partnership idea that actually uh, together you can achieve more than you can separately. 
Now, if you want to find out a bit more about the Ecoco Life project, please do go to their website. But the reason I mention it is because this is where um, our sort of interaction with the idea of how we can encourage stakeholders to get involved in um, ecological coherence uh, sort of mapping and, and the protocol uh, came in. And we were able to assist uh, Paul Sizeland, the project manager at that time, uh, with a piece of work that coincided with their final year of delivery. Now, the ECOCO project was all about looking at how you can implement integrated habitat networks across central Scotland, really about how you can improve ecological coherence. So lots of the kind of modelling that we've, we've heard about this morning uh, was part of the ECOCO project. And one of their key outputs was to try and develop and follow an ecological coherence protocol. And the idea behind this was to test sites and target actions. So you, you, you could find those locations uh, where you could have the best possible um, chance of maximising uh, benefits for, for people and wildlife. And they ran this tool, uh, ran this sort of protocol across the area, focused on 12 management zones that they worked in. And then we came in at the end and uh, provided a piece of work that was uh, sort of sense checking this tool and um, using it in a, in a precise area. And I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, when we came into this piece of work and um, we were trying to encourage others, uh, look for other stakeholders to be part of it, um, we had to get our heads around the idea of ecological coherence. Now, um, I'm not an ecologist by training. Lots of my, uh, my past experience is in working with communities and stakeholders and getting people out of doors. So um, it's quite handy that Paul could point me towards um, a definition of ecological coherence SNH had, uh, had sort of um, worked on. Um, and for those of you who perhaps need a, a, a bit of a, a refresh on a, on a Wednesday morning and into the idea of that, um, I'd encourage you to seek out this document and find out a little bit more about it. But really, it's looking at the idea of how you can um, look across an area, wherever you choose to draw your line, um, and ensure that you have that mixture of protected sites, how you can ensure that you have habitats and species supported across their natural range, um, and how you have that variety um, at different scales in an area and ensuring, of course, that um, that network, that variation, those species and habitats um, are resilient to uh, sort of damage and, and future change, um, however that change and damage may be caused. So it's quite a big principle, but actually something that we had to uh, communicate to the people that we were looking to get invo involved in this work. And the model that we were uh, given by ECOCO, the model that they had been using to identify uh, their locations to work um, was uh, relatively straightforward, it'd be fair to say. They were looking at where there were existing habitat networks in an area, where uh, considering then the ecosystem services and the impact that that has across the area, and then looking for those opportunity areas. Um, and when you bring those three together um, in an ideal world, you come up with those locations where you want to um, spend your uh, investment. But there are also the benefits of uh, trying to work in this way and bringing other stakeholders into uh, this conversation. Um, I think it was touched on a little bit earlier, is that you can not just perhaps model um, using GIS systems about where you where you would uh, like to make this investment and where you can see the opportunities, but it also means that you have a, a kind of clear um, idea about where you're looking to protect. You're clearly talking about the, the locations where you can maximise benefits and also create win-wins for, for both people and wildlife. And the reason that we were looking to bring wider stakeholders into the, the piece of work that we were doing was to ensure that we could um, uh, speak with a collaborative voice. Um, both the ECOCO Life Project and the Inner for Futures Partnership, um, you know, we're, we're partnerships, some of our members are the same, we work uh, across uh, sort of overlapping areas. So we're speaking lots to lots of the same people, but we sort of have, you know, differing um, uh, principles behind our work. But one thing that we're really keen on through the, uh, the Inner for Futures Partnership is that working in partnership and not just um, uh, creating uh, you know reports that sit on a shelf that um, you know are our sort of vision but trying to bring in other people to that conversation bringing in their knowledge their experience um, 
different um, ways of looking at things. And as we started to see, I think, through the slide over, um, we'd identified that working in this way um, and considering ecosystems uh, in this way uh, could help us to both target resources and um, to maybe find opportunities to talk to funders about where to target uh, the limited funds that they have um, and also to, to sort of think about the planning environment as well. Now, um, we worked with quite a range of stakeholders when we were carrying out this work. We, as a partnership um, from our previous lottery funded work, had worked with a range of ENGOs and local authorities and statutory agencies through something we'd called the Inner Force Natural Heritage Working Group. So we already had an existing structure that we could use, we could go to and say, um, we would like to use the ECOCO, Ecological Coherence Protocol, to um, sort of review habitats across the inner fourth area and to try and create an inner fourth habitat map. Would you like to be part of that? Um, the group said yes, which is always fantastic to hear. Um, and we had a discussion about who else we'd want to bring into that. Um, because whilst we had, uh, we sort of, we'd come together for a particular purpose before, we acknowledged that actually there were stakeholders out there that um, it would be beneficial to bring into this as well so they could bring in their knowledge. So we brought in others such as SEPA, who we hadn't worked with before, um, the Woodland Trust, Wildlife Information Centre, who are our local uh, nature record centre for the Fourth Valley area, um, and um, a number of uh, local recorders as well. So folk who um, have that sort of maybe species specific knowledge um, that they've built up over time. And the other important thing around this was that um, the work we were looking to do was actually um, slightly wider than the area in which our existing partnership had worked for the previous four years. We were looking to expand where we were working, so we needed that extra geographical knowledge. So as essentially contractors to ECOCO, we carried out an area based review of the ecological coherence protocol that they had been using for their work. And as I said before, through Inner Fourth Futures and Inner Fourth Landscape Initiative, we've worked in this sort of lozenge area in central Scotland. But what we did through this process was kind of roll it out to a much wider area um, uh, across um, the central Scotland green network areas of Falkirk, Stirling, Clackmannanshire and Fife. So the area on the, the right. It's a pretty hefty area of central Scotland. Um, and in particular, we were looking to consider um, a small number of specific habitat types through this process. We also had a number of outputs that we were uh, looking to deliver, um, not just uh, to ECOCO so that they could ensure they've got the right outputs for their funding, um, but also so that we had um, uh, sort of some uh, useful tools uh, and documents that we could use to continue our work in the area. So we were um, encouraging folk to get involved, um, sort of uh, that little sales talk to our Natural Heritage Working Group and others by saying, if we come together, we're going to create this habitat, mapped habitat network for the area under a collective vision and a, a call to action that can help to deliver this. Not just that, but through our way of uh, reviewing the protocol, we'll be able to refine it and we'll be able to create a, create a practitioner's guide that will mean that others who want to go through this process will be able to learn from what we've done in the past. In, yeah, learn from what we've done. Um, and the practitioner's guide um, I'll come to um, in a moment is available on our website. So we ended up reviewing, uh, following the protocol through a series of three face to face workshops. Um, and through each of these workshops, we took one element of the protocol and focused on it. And we chose to start with habitat networks as our first piece of the puzzle. And prior to the workshop, um, we collected a wide range of data, um, partly from uh, Nature Scott's integrated habitat network mapping that the local authorities had access to, also things like um, protected areas mapping, um, maps of where local nature reserves were and local, na local nature conservation sites, um, and also data sets from different organisations. So we had things like um, ancient woodland inventory as well. We were able to um, present this mapping on, on large scale maps and um, as you would back in 2018, uh, head into a small room together, enjoy cups of tea and cake together um, and pick up your pens um, and start to draw on these maps. 
So the process that we went through was posing two key questions to the, the sort of 15, 20 folk who came along to this first session. And we said, for the mapped habitats that we've shown, for this small range of map habitats that we've shown for the, uh, for the project area, where are the important areas to conserve? So where are the existing areas of habitat that we know are important and we know are important to conserve? And then where are the opportunities to create new habitats in the area? When you think about those woodlands, um, grassland and OMH habitat, peatlands and heathlands, rivers and wetlands and intertidal. Obviously creating new habitat doesn't work for all of those, but for some of those it will do. And so we were able to sit down and review the maps and use people's local knowledge and their uh, other documents they'd brought along to actually map that out on the day using that. We took that away um, and uh, uh, uploaded that into our GIS system, um, remapped it and came back to our second session <clears throat> with a map that looked a little bit like this. Um, and it kind of showed the designated areas where the rivers were um, and where we felt there were those important areas to conserve, but also sort of wider network opportunities. And I guess what is important to say at this point is that we've heard this morning already about um, some fantastic opportunities through GIS to look at this. But the approach we were taking was very much based on that local knowledge, local stakeholders. So this mapping um, we took and we then reviewed through a second workshop where we considered the second piece of the puzzle, the idea of ecosystem services. So we'd already had a conversation at this group level around the sort of variety of ecosystem services that habitats create, uh, provide in the area um, and which ones we might want to um, select to then uh, sort of sense check against the, the mapped network that we were, we were starting to draw. Um, and in our area, we selected four. We looked at flood risk, air quality, Scottish index of multiple deprivation and land capability for agriculture, which is the, the Scottish soils map. We did consider other things. We looked at a whole load of um, SEPA ecosystem services data as well, um, but decided that these four were um, probably most uh, relevant across the whole area. Um, and for those of you um, who, who are less familiar with central Scotland, um, there's great areas of wealth, but there's also quite large areas of inequality. And that's in particular why we chose the SIMD index, because it meant that we could consider that local access to green space and the kind of well-being and health benefits that um, good quality habitats bring as well. So. What we didn't do was start afresh. We took our mapped habitat network, we looked at the mapped uh, details of these ecosystem services and did a visual comparison and it had a discussion and looked at, okay, well, where are there opportunities um, for, for, for these to maybe change what we'd thought about before? Um, uh, how does that change it? Where does it change it and why? And what it also did, did was enabled us to look back, so look at this map and look at where the gaps are. So you'll see that there were some areas of the pilot area that, that we hadn't uh, sort of drawn as uh, important areas for any of these key habitats or opportunities for uh, sort of new creation of habitats. And we were able to have that discussion around, well, what does it mean to leave an area on the map blank? Um, how might people use this data in the future and what, what, what um, would they interpret from um, us not uh, saying that there's any opportunities there to create new habitats? And we were quite clear in our thinking um, as a group that we didn't want to show blank areas. We wanted to show that no matter where you were in this pilot area, there were always going to be opportunities to uh, create some type of habitat or a kind of matrix of habitats. Um, it may not be uh, quite as easy as saying you should create woodland, woodland here or wetland. It may be a combination of the two, maybe creating kind of multifunctional habitats. Which takes us on to the third session that we ran. And this third session was looking at the third piece of the puzzle of the ecosystems, um, the ecological coherence protocol. It was looking at the opportunity areas. Um, and this was again taking our mapped network and saying, OK, well, if we wanted to try and turn this into action um, on the ground, actually uh, deliver some work, where would we want to do that? Um, who would we need to, to get on board to enable that to happen? What would we need to be lined up? Um, and maybe what are the barriers as well? 
Um, and actually, the, some of the things in the Slido there are that, that um, uh, Nina had earlier um, are exactly the kinds of topics that came up when we started to talk about this. Um, we might have um, a fantastic location where we can enhance some wetland area, um, but unfortunately there may be challenges uh, uh, to funding um, and maybe a neighbouring landowner um, is less keen on that um, happening. So, uh, and perhaps the policy frameworks are very challenging to make that occur. So we had this quite lengthy discussion and what we were able to do was um, uh, pinpoint a, a number of ideas and bring them together into a call to action document. And this is roughly where um, the sort of funded piece of work that we were delivering for the Eco Co Life project uh, kind of closed. Um, but it's definitely not where the, the story finished for our, for our uh, group of stakeholders and, and for our partnership. So what we ended up with at the end of the pilot um, was uh, a series of maps, uh, a pilot map for the east of the pilot area and a pilot map for the west of the area. And the mapped network is, we talk about the map network about the whole of the area. So that we're clear that that's the network. Um, this is very much based on that, uh, taking the existing data, reviewing it with people's local knowledge, looking at it through a sort of ecosystem services um, perspectives and thinking about opportunities as well. And through this collaborative process, we were able to kind of refine um, how you might run a process like this with others. Um, we had good discussions about um, did you need to start by thinking about those habitat networks or could you perhaps start this process by thinking about ecosystem services or opportunity areas? Um, and within our group, we came to a decision that actually um, you could start anywhere in that, that sort of uh, trio of, of principles. Um, it perhaps depends on the scale you're looking at. You might be looking um, maybe on a sort of uh, a, a one sort of land holding scale, in which case you might start with opportunities because you know what opportunities you have in that patch of land. Um, or perhaps, again, if you were coming at it from a uh, a different principle, you might start with the ecosystem services side of things. So we have this map network. We also have it as a, a GIS package. Um, and what we uh, have done is made it available on both our website and the Ecoco Life website. But when we present this, we're very clear at presenting uh, that we try and present it as a whole. Um, we don't have um, individual maps that show, say, the wetlands, the peatlands and the woodlands. We very consciously have this all presented together because we felt that um, it may, makes most sense when the data is presented as one because there is so much um, sort of interconnectivity between this. Um, and you could equally perhaps take one package, uh, one uh, sort of section, perhaps woodlands, um, and you could perhaps take it out of context um, and, and not see that we've um, looked at the other um, types of habitats across the area. Now, I also mentioned that we were creating a practitioner's guide and the sort of purpose of the process we went through was to try and refine it to, to ensure that we had a, an actual output at the end that we could, um, we could uh, suggest that others followed. So what we did was to um, put together um, a, a guide, which again, it's a sort of six or so side uh, of A4. It's again, downloadable from our websites. Um, and it, it sets out the kind of policy context for what we went through. It, it revises the protocol. So it gives you those staged processes to go through, things to consider. Um, and it presents the process that we went through in the inner fourth as a case study. So I'd, I'd send you towards that if you'd like to find out a little bit more about the detail of what we went through. Um, it gives also some data sources. Thanks, Nina, Grand. It gives some data sources for, for where we actually gathered our data as well. Um, and we found this quite a useful um, tool. Now, I mentioned that we also were starting to create a call to action. And this is really uh, where our group of stakeholders continued working. And our call to action was actually only fi finalised last year. So it had taken about another 18 months to work through. And what we've ended up with is um, a couple of sides of A4 for each of our five key habitat areas. And those are our habitat action plans. It's a set of um, key actions that as a group, we feel need to um, occur in the inner fourth area to um, deliver 
the mapped habitat network. Um, there will definitely be other actions as well, but these are the ones that our group of stakeholders identified. We were also identify, able to identify some of the barriers to action, whether that, that might be funding, policy, or maybe land use and other issues. We could pinpoint some priority locations and consider those constraints and opportunities. And what this actually neatly means is that we have uh, this call to action that we are going to start uh, this year promoting to others. But it also gives us a little bit of a bank of project ideas if opportunities such as funding do come up. But how does this work fit into the wider context? Well, I have a feeling that Max Hislop, um, who was one of the speakers last week, talked much more about the policy context. So I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. But the work that we did um, feeds into the Central Scotland Green Network um, uh, sort of place for nature priority. And the CSGN is uh, a key part of Scotland's um, national planning framework. It's also uh, an opportunity to demonstrate what a national ecological network could look like. We mapped one at a regional scale. It's one process that we went through. Others have done it in other ways. Um, and they've certainly done different things over in the, uh, the Glasgow and Clyde Valley area. But we also found that it was an opportunity to share what we did with others. And this, again, is where the practitioner's guide came in. So over in Edinburgh, through the Edinburgh's Thriving Green Spaces project, uh, Donya Davidson and her colleagues um, are going through a very similar process, um, but with a, a bit more of the GIS um, modelling side of things, I think it'd be fair to say. Um, they're using the principles of that, using the, the, the protocol approach um, to map out um, an ecological coherence plan for Edinburgh. So it's quite exciting to see how someone can take a piece of work and um, adapt it for their local processes. And back in the inner fourth, um, we've been able to use our mapped habitat network and use our call to action to secure funding. Um, we uh, secured funding about 100k through the Nature Scots Biodiversity Challenge Fund last financial year. And that enabled us to um, work on four sites in the area to enhance them for wetlands. And this, again, was led through the Inner Fourth Futures Partnership, but involved work with uh, Fife Council, Falkirk Council, um, Stirling Council and the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So we came together um, again through that partnership, um, through that um, idea of the Inner Fourth Habitat Network and found opportunities to deliver for nature and for people as well. And it's also the ideas through the Habitat Network are also helping us to think about where next. Through our partnership, we are starting to develop a new project called Climate Fourth. We're hoping to secure funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, um, and we're starting to develop um, an application that will go into them later this summer. And it's all about um, supporting resilience for habitats, for heritage, um, for communities, and, and moving towards those net zero ambitions. So if our funding uh, uh, application comes off, hopefully in 2022, we'll be delivering uh, some exciting uh, development work. And then we also hope that we'll be able to deliver some uh, uh, work on the ground from 2023 onwards. But certainly the work that we've done through the habitat network mapping, through the use of the ecological coherence protocol is really at the core of uh, that uh, new project. So I'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks so much for that, Kate. Um, and that was quite exciting to see that you have an app as well. I definitely need to check that out. Um, I think that was extremely interesting just to see kind of how stakeholders can come together and how this sort of, uh, I guess, hu human driven approach can, and kind of somewhat more, more removed from, you know, computers and, and modeling and just had kind of having that aspect in this conversation. And but again, highlighting just, you know, the importance of, of working together and, you know, having all the relevant stakeholders as part of that, the, these conversations. Um, but beyond that, I think it was quite exciting just to see kind of where you started and how you're now at the stages of having secured some funding and hopefully securing even further funding to actually deliver on those proposed projects and, and outcomes really that came out from, from all that work. So I guess you must be in a very exciting stage with all this. So it must have been quite nice to be able to 
kind of been involved throughout this process as well and seeing, you know, the fruit of your labor, I guess. Um, I guess we'll just move on. I can see there's quite a few questions that have been coming through already. So I'll just very quickly share um, my screen and run through the, the format for the Q&A. Um, so like I said, I've seen quite a few people um, sending through questions already. Um, but just for those who haven't, um, please use the Q&A functionality and it should be on everybody's screen at the bottom. Um, if you can at all, uh, please mark down which members or, or member of the panel you would like to pose your question to. Um, and then we can do that on your behalf. Um, there is also the box, like I said earlier, to tick um, if you want to make your question um, anonymous and also if you want to upvote your question, just so we can make sure to prioritize them. There is the, the thumbs, thumbs up functionality. Um, da, 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 da. Anything else? I think that should be everything. Um, so let's see um, where we can get to. If all the panelists, if you could please turn your cameras on so we can all see everybody. And I shall try to pull up that. Q&A functionality for myself as well. Great. Um, so yes, uh, there's quite a few questions that have come through already and please keep them coming. Um, first one, maybe we'll go to you, um, Sarah, because there was quite a few for you. <laughs> And that came through early on, just so we can recap on your work. Um, this is from Carolyn Thorogood. Um, really amazing data and modeling looks, looks super useful. Um, firstly, as a practitioner, how can we access, um, I, uh, she referenced the model, but I guess any of these um, uh, inputs and outputs, um, and then the question I got lost. The question got lost because somebody added a new one. Secondly, nature networks will be an important for connecting people with nature and supporting well-being and equality um, when it comes to access. Is there data on accessibility to green space that could be also included into this work? Yeah, thanks very much, Caroline. That's really good couple of questions there. Uh, first of all, in terms of accessibility, um, some of the data sets I mentioned are available via our GIS managers, a, a sort of a, a particular email address and, and website. I can try and put that in the chat in a moment um, or by contacting me. So you can get in touch with me. I put my contact details on the last slide. So uh, yeah, please feel free to get in touch. Some of them are publicly available. Some of them are just, you know, um, we uh, work together on them as opposed to just having a website to dish them out. Um, in terms of accessible green space, yeah, really important. And, you know, as we've seen over the last year or so, how important uh, natural green space is for people's well-being, um, really crucial. Um, our Nature Network's handbook, you know, I mentioned briefly the fact that it talks about the users, you know, the human users of an ecological network, as well as the um, nature beneficiaries too. And it's really important to um, bring those things together um we don't have so far in the kind of data sets that i provided today or, or talked through briefly today the you know green infrastructure or accessible natural green space isn't included in those um but really i've scratched the surface on the amount of on the sort of available data that will be going into the nature recovery network toolkit for example so there will be data sets that can talk to those kinds of things that you mentioned um, I think it's probably really important to do that at a kind of local level, you know, think, think about the kind of stuff that you have on the ground and the, and the more detailed local data that you might um, have there. You, we really, you know, at a national level, we are thinking about where we put nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation, for, for climate change mitigation. And, you know, it's really important to, you know, have that 
get the best impact out of the kind of location of those things so the, the right stuff in the right place um, and all the other kind of socioeconomic uh, uh, data sets that would be useful within that um, but yeah we have the people in nature survey as well where lots of uh, information is gathered via the you you know from people how they use local green space how they use their how far they travel for things what they like to see when they get there all of that kind of stuff and we have a people in nature program as well so that's really important to feed in the kind of information from that survey and from the work that they do on socioeconomic impacts and you know a lot of the findings from the you know over the pandemic and the injustices in terms of uh you know lack of access for certain types of people certain groups certain areas um hugely complex and important to uh important to include not only for people's well-being and, and benefits but also because we know through that survey that if people have access and, and value something um if they, if they have access to it more readily, they'll value it into the future and look after it. So yeah, all kinds of reasons why that stuff should be included. Um, and yeah, a good point needs to be included spatially as well as uh, you know verbally and in partnership as Kate's project showed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess when you read about it quickly, it becomes a lot more relevant at that level. level. Um, and it's not that issue people going on at that national level, but when it comes to the actual phenomenon, sorry but i think you have a problem with your speak with your speaker and headphones i know you don't you don't use that but i don't know what's going on we cannot really hear you any better? Not really. I was worried it was just me. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've gone underwater or something. I shall try my best. It's been working so well so far. <laughs> I know. Is it still bad? Yeah, it's gone a bit funny. It might be your connection, I suppose. But stuff you can't do anything about. any better yay <laughs> yes good <laughs> good thing i have backup um i don't know where you lost me um i guess um i might just repeat myself um uh when it comes to you know access and all of this that we talked about um i guess it's even though you need to have that kind of bigger scale awareness for it and um i guess national level data sets and and so on on this it comes a lot more relevant at a local level doesn't it and obviously that's even more you know highlighted now during you know several lockdowns i don't even know what number this is now um but i guess it's come very much to people's or to the forefront of, of people's thinking, you know? So I would only imagine that this sort of thinking is gonna become more and more linked into when it comes to conversations around nature recovery networks on the whole, but you know, when it comes to our green spaces. Um, and I guess there was another question, which I guess, um, Kate, you might be able to expand on. Uh, I've lost my mouse now because I had to plug in my um, my headset. Um, there was a question, I think, for uh, that came through anonymously um, for Kate. If ECOCO stakeholder consultation modeling was done in 2018, i.e. pre-lockdown, um, and all other restrictions and their impacts on society obviously having come out of that um does this need do, would you think that you would like to do a rerun um of your i guess mapping um 
due to that, obviously people's priorities and preferences regarding land use and access might have changed since. And I guess this could be, you know, relevant for you somewhat, Sarah, as well. But obviously you're looking at the bigger picture. Um, but do you think that there is anything in terms of not just including new data sets, but as well new kind of um, aspects that need to be included um, to this sort of thinking just because of, you know, the impacts of lockdown and people changes, I guess, in people's behavior. But if you could um, start with that, Kate, and, and see whether that has been something that you have been um, considering. Sure. So we have had a conversation around um, uh, when we might want to look again at this um, and we really focus that conversation around uh, sort of refreshing our call to action rather than perhaps the, the kind of mapping that's behind it um, and I guess where the challenge comes is that the group of people that we we had involved in that um, uh, lots of those uh, individuals work for organizations that are heavily reliant on grant funding um, uh, our, our partnership uh, again uh, operates through the sort of contributions from partners but also external grants so um, being able to be in a position where you plan something like that into your your kind of uh, your, your work um, uh, where you maybe don't have a piece of funding to do it can be a little bit challenging um, but that's not to say that it, there's no um, uh, you know no benefit in doing that um, I think what uh, might be most interesting is looking at those kind of opportunities and the ecosystem, ecosystem services side of things um, and taking the, the idea of looking at a local level. So um, we carried out a mapping for, for a very large area, but that um, um, is much wider than the, the area that our partnership usually works across. So we could perhaps take elements of uh, sort of, you know, a smaller geographical area um, and sort of redo the process at that scale. Um, I think that would be manageable, but again, it's whether um, we see a benefit in doing that. You know, what's the purpose in doing that? Is it going to help us achieve our aims? Um, or is it simply so we're putting kind of refresh out into the into the wider world? Um, and I guess it also think comes into thinking about how we hoped this data might be used. So um, it's data that the um, the stakeholders who were involved in it all signed up to. They all, you know, agreed with the outputs. It was at that sort of collaborative level, um, and we hope that it's a, a piece of work that um, others will refer to when they're making decisions, whether that might be planners um, or perhaps local landowners. Um, that's obviously quite aspirational. We have a lot of work to do around promoting it and going out to other stakeholders. There's another question in there around um, how, yes, we missed out people such as maybe tourism sector or um, um, farmers, for example. Um, farming is quite a big, big part of our landscape. Um, yeah, we, we have a, a acknowledged in our reporting that we did not reach all stakeholders. It was a focused um, look. Um, at, at what we could do in a particular time frame. So we're very certain that if we do come to redo this, we will go out to other stakeholders. Um, and in fact, our call to action would be informed by speaking with those wider stakeholders as well. Um, but unfortunately, at this particular point in time, it does come down to that um, uh, sort of where you can put effort due to the funding that you have. Yep, that would have been very much my next question because I noticed that that other, uh, other one to do with stakeholders. So. Um, thanks very much on picking up on that. Um, I guess I might come back to um, the actual kind of practicalities, both inside of uh, or in terms of um, having access to data sets for your own mapping and, and having people involved in that process. We talk a lot about different stakeholders and, and different data sets, but both in terms of uh, data sets coming in um, towards your mapping exercise or modeling exercise and in terms of um, touching upon what we touched upon with, with Sarah in terms of sharing those outputs as well there was a question that came came through from Jane highlighting um, that in, in Northern Ireland especially we do often have um, issues with um, having publicly um, available data sets. So I wondered whether actually all of you three um, <laughs> might be able to highlight 
um, at all? Did you have any issues in terms of accessing data for your work or any kind of data and license kind of licensing and sharing issues, but also kind of the decisions when it comes to making certain outputs available and, and certain not um, certain outputs potentially not available and how should they be made available? I know it's it's a quick big question, but I wondered whether you could all touch upon a little bit kind of both inputs and outputs access and 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 sharing and sort of considerations that uh, or even just you know threshold that you might have faced um, yourselves. If you wouldn't mind um, starting, Kate, because you were already on the screen. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks, Nina. Uh, so data inputs, um, we, uh, so I say we, um, the, the data mapping was um, the GIS systems were run through RSPB. So um, we had a number of data sharing agreements with um, local authorities already, but we may, I'm just, apologies, stretch my memory a touch, we may have had to set up separate data agreements to ensure that we could uh, use the data that um, the local authorities had. Um, although I have a feeling that the, the base data that we used was uh, Nature Scott's integrated habitat map, um, which um, uh, if it's not publicly available, it was certainly available to RSPB through the Enforce Futures Partnership through the Central Scotland Green Network Trust. Um, so that uh, sort of partnership approach was beneficial. Um, we did use publicly accessible data um, from other organisations like the Ancient Woodland Inventory um, and uh, protected area data. Um, data outputs. Um, I think if you look at uh, the mapping that we have presented um, on our website and the GIS layers that we have available. Um, the, the only sort of direct data that we are showing on that from other sources is that protected area data. We have essentially redrawn the opportunity areas and redrawn the important areas for conservation. Um, yep, they probably overlap very heavily with, um, with some of that other data, um, but it's, it's been informed by the process we've gone through. Um, we didn't actually discuss whether there were any challenges in presenting that back out, um, which is a very interesting question. So I'll be interested to maybe take that back to some of my colleagues uh, to have a chat about. Um, but yeah, that's that's how we went through the process. Thanks, um, Sarah. Would you mind expanding on that from your perspective at all? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a huge issue and it, it's something that you come across all the time. And, you know, you want to use some data, some really great stuff that's out there. Um, and then you have to be really mindful about maybe the fact that as Natural England, a, a large organisation, we have those contracts or licences, but then what do we want to do with it and who do we want to hand it out to? You know, that's the, the main point of anything that we do, not to keep hold of it, but to, you know, give it out to people if, if it's, you know, for them to use, if it's useful. So, yeah, it's really annoying. It can be very frustrating at times um, because you know that there's something there that you can use. Uh, we have uh, come up against that, particularly with the use of soils data in the, nature, in the um, uh, National Habitat Network. So we use something that was available that we could share, you know, in the end um, to, to, to be able to give that stuff out. It can be a really convoluted process just internally to get, you know, to get people to sign off on sending something out, even if the, even if the licensed stuff is really hidden and completely un able to be kind of re-engineered back out and um yeah like i said it can be quite frustrating so uh, yeah i just think that we really need to get some of that stuff sorted and and stop you know putting so many constraints on things whilst you know clearly we need to uh, respect the the work that's gone into something um but a lot of the time there'll be public money that's going into the collection of data and then only available on license and that seems like a strange thing to um a strange situation to be in uh, so yeah, it's uh, something to very much be aware of when you're creating something. Um, and I think, yeah, a lot of us, uh, uh, you know, collectively, we need to get our act together a bit and free up some of this stuff. Thanks for that. Um, uh, Ian, I wonder whether you would have anything to add on from this or the sort of Northern Irish perspective and also um, in relation to the, the kind of outputs that you might have from this particular um, project on the living maps as well. 
Yes, um, cer certainly. Um, as a government agency, we're 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 signed up to the Northern Ireland Open Data Strategy. So, new projects open by design is kind of the default position. And with this product, yes, I should have said, um, it is going to be completely open under open government license. Um, and we have ensured that all of the because there's an awful lot of uh, data from various sources that goes into this, but we have checked with those uh, owners that they are happy that this output product is going to be open uh, and, and freely available. And um, because that's key to making sure that there is no restrictive covenant placed on it, um, uh, other than people obviously using it in, in, in the right way. But uh, I don't think we have any particular concerns there. So yes, th this will be um, a, a, fr a freely available product. And in terms of our own, other data surveys um, and uh, data provision, yes, that that again is going down this sort of it's like a UK charter really for government um, open uh, openness and open by design because it promotes so many other um, you know um, subsequent good projects and collaborations that maybe weren't thought of without that data being out there. So yes, that is our plan, and I think it was a maybe a particular question driven at NI Dira and. Certainly around reports and um, research as well. We're we're about to launch um, this um, initiative called the Knowledge Hub, and it's just a better way, a more structured database for people to be able to query all of the research papers uh, that we've uh, had over over the years and be able to define those in sort of contextual searches as well. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of our default position. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Ian. That's that's very useful information. Um, uh, there was really a couple of questions when it comes to species, um, and I think these are really directed to you, Sarah. Um, first of all, uh, uh, thanks again for your fascinating presentation. Uh, I guess the, the first one was really touching on, on Contatis um, as a model, um, and there was a question coming from Georgina their gate um, asking what are the your wh what are you basing the your flow on is it plant species VRC dispersion or is it animal species associated with with the particular habitats but there was an all, also another one from from Peter Archdale um, highlighting um, a uh, book from Benedict MacDonald um, and the experiences that were highlighted in the book, in particular in context, the, the, the project NEP, the rewilding project that um, many of you might have heard of, and which really indicates that our understanding of animal species and habitat preferences aren't always sound. So I wondered whether you could, you could expand on the kind of species thinking, um, but also discuss just a little bit uh, about Condatis and, and where that the flow was coming from, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's a really great questions. And I think it's probably at the root of why we focus so much on habitats and the kind of broader habitat approach that underpins most of the work that we've done together. So most of the stuff that Natural England have created uh, does come from that priority habitat inventory. I know there's lots of questions and queries about the, um, the, the quality of that as well. And, you know, we hope to, yeah, increase the quality of it and, and the accuracy of it. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to find information on species preferences and dispersal distances and things like that. We, we, can, we keep looking every time we do something regarding ecological networks or uh, models that use those kinds of uh, parameters. We, we have a look around to see if anything new has come up and it's still very uh, limited information. Uh, and that does yeah, bring us back to the use of habitats um, more broadly and connections between habitats or you know, um, naturally functioning systems that support the range of species that we would like to see. So I think that's probably the kind of principle, I guess, underpinning this is that we'll create more habitat, more connected and more naturally functioning and it hopefully will support things. That's not to mention, not to sort of uh, put to one side the the specialist needs of some species, you know, where we do have that really, you know, that knowledge or we're really looking after some specialist species in particular locations. We want to focus on that in, in other ways, I suppose, in more local ways. Um, but yeah, we do use them to back up our thought processes, I suppose, and going into something like Condatis. Um, 
the recent project, we worked with Tom Travers, a PhD student at um, Liverpool University. And we got together our species and habitat experts. So when we focused on a particular habitat or a group of habitats, we got together with the species um, experts to ask if there were any representative species that we could use where we did have any real data and information from, you know, from studies on the ground and all that. So where we where it is available, we use it. Um, but again, so we use it in you know specific examples um, and in in broad ways, I guess. So we haven't done stuff like least cost path analysis where we're really linking a, ne a network to preferences of a species. We've created that wider habitat uh, focus. But yeah, Condatis uses species, so we have to uh, find some examples that we're happy to use. Uh, but being open about it is the most important thing. Explain what we've done and explain why. Um, and yeah, keep looking for those new examples. Yeah, and, and I guess those kind of species specific least cost pathway modeling outputs could be something that could be utilized when it comes to the actual decision making. If we are, you know, putting in um, applications for funding or designing projects, you know, when we have different sorts of um, nature covering network maps or habitat network maps, and in top of that, the likes of Condatis and, and all other um, ecosystem service sort of data sets, I guess, species specific modeling, again, it, it could be something else to kind of add on to that in terms of supporting that decision making when you might be, you know, between two different options. Um, for example, um, so I, I guess you could consider them as a sort of um, decision supporting tool, um, which obviously is first and foremost based on, let's say, the habitat networks, but then all of these other aspects and other data sets can contribute towards those final decisions. Yeah, sure. If you've got specific examples and you've got real data that you can use in an area, that's great. Um, I, I guess it's just not over egging it at the national scale, you know, designing an entire network for a generic species, you know, why, why focus on the species, you know, I guess the approach we've taken is to, you know, group habitats and start from that kind of where stuff is and where we can create more stuff. Um, yep. And then lay that on, you know, lay the other information when we can find it onto that. And yeah, I know I presented lots of different things and there's even more on that. But that's the um, the point, really, is that you can't cram everything into one network tool. You want to use lots of different pieces of information. Yep. Uh, yeah. 100% makes plenty of sense. Um, I guess there was, I think, a couple of um, questions, which I think you all might have touched upon a little bit. But I wonder whether we could expand on um, when we talk about habitats, talking all about also about habitat quality um and i wonder i guess i wonder if you could start on that ian in particular in terms of the living maps and how capable or non-capable is the system to look at not just habitat types but condition as well and i wonder um if on top of that sarah and katie if you wouldn't mind expanding on kind of where has it been possible to input that already um, or at the same time not possible when it has um, when it comes to I guess your particular um, mapping exercises because um, um, obviously when we talk about habitats it's not just about what's there but it's also is it in good condition enough to support the species that um, that it's based on, I guess. Okay, um, well, yes, to, to start with, I guess, and certainly our, our, our main ambition at the moment is identifying uh, habitats and extent, but um, yes, those in a highly modified uh, landscape uh, as Northern Ireland, then yes, looking at uh, condition is, is a next step. And uh, certainly with our joint partners and JNCC and other interagencies, um, that is an area that we're looking at at the moment in parallel and, and so there are some variables that you can certainly pull out. You can look at sort of abandonment and encroachment with scrubbing uh, on certain habitat types. You can look at, you know, in peatland, you can, uh, we're looking at uh, bare peat 
as a as an indicator of um, you know something um, suboptimal um, that's happening. Obviously, burnt areas. Most recently, you know, unfortunately, in the morns, which we picked up there on, on the on the weekend, yeah, those you know obvious scarring um, entities they they pull out very well. And then there's um, uh, indicators of wetness, um, which again um, uh, indices that you can then um, associate, um, particularly around those those wetland habitats, um, peatland as well. Um, Particularly, so um, yes, these are these are things that we're 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 looking at. Um, some of the fine granularity that can only be pulled out through quadrat-based survey, then that's obviously a challenge. But um, some of the the, the bigger uh, obvious elements, um, as I say, such as erosion, encroachment, um, scrubbing, um, fire damage, um, wetness, those are things that we can look at and are looking. At. Yep, that makes plenty of sense. And I guess we're talking about technology as well. And the techno technology would like to think is all, only going to improve going forward. So these are the sort of thinking processes that might be um, relevant going forward as well in terms of trying to start incorpor incorporating this sort of thinking more and more. Um, but it's really interesting to see how much is already is able to pick up on and obviously you know with that ecological know-how then you can start linking that to when it comes to you know pear peat you know that obviously naturally relates to the condition of of that habitat type and so on so that was really interesting thanks anything to add um maybe sarah and then we could go to to kate yeah, thanks. Uh, very quickly, I mean, we I guess we're already focusing on a certain quality or type of habitat by focusing mainly on the priority habitat inventory. We're already saying that that's a particular type of semi-natural habitat that reaches a certain quality. But then, you know, in the in the National Habitat Network, we incorporate that kind of creation and restoration on the way and also some of those restorable habitats as part of, you know, the focus of where you could do stuff. In the vulnerability assessment, we've got some quality indicators within the management and condition metric. Um, we look at things like triple SIs and agri-environment schemes that are delivering biodiversity benefit as a bit of a proxy for something going on there that's better quality than um, something else. But also in the fragmentation metric, we look at where current PHI level habitat is, but also in the wider um, metric about permeability, we draw in other semi-natural land cover types from a different data set, so that broadens it again. And Condatis, there is a way, it's not got something uh, specific about quality, but there's a way to kind of weight or, or give a, a coverage of an area that's in Condatis uh, to sort of give, again, a proxy of, of quality. But yeah, something that's important to um, draw in, because we need to focus on better as well as bigger and more enjoyed. Just come in briefly. Um, so I guess with the process we did, we were we were using the existing data that was out there. Um, yeah, we certainly um, had discussions around um, uh, sort of the the quality of that data, but also the quality that the habitats might be. Um, I think this is really where our conversations around the opportunity areas came in. Um, we were looking at how we could. Um, create benefits for, for the landscape, for habitat species and for people. So um, that was where we were able to use that local level knowledge to say, OK, well, you know, we may have some fantastic and no wetland habitat in one place, but actually um, we know there's an opportunity to create more or to, to enhance that. And that would benefit the wider network. And here's a dot on the map where we could do that. And um, here are some ideas of where we could look for some funding. So I think from our perspective, that was the approach that we took. Um, and the hope is that with this this map network and the call to action, um, both sort of collectively through the partnership and as individual agencies, we might look for further opportunities to to deliver that and, and sort of embed that idea of increasing habitats or enhancing habitat quality, I guess, uh, through through different methods. Almost talked to myself uh, <laughs> being muted. Um, Great. That, that's really interesting, actually, um, what you've just said there um, and how you can kind of come into it from from that opportunity areas uh, perspective as well and, and how that sort of highlights that sort of thinking as well. Um, I think 
we have almost managed to go through all of these questions. <laughs> this is um, probably most relevant um, to Sarah, but potentially Ian as well. And feel free, obviously, Kate, to, to add on to this. Um, it's quite a big one. It's come in anonymously. Um, but I guess it's most relevant really to Sarah in terms of, um, you know, climate change, adaptation and mitigation. There's a question that has come through asking, will the wider plans to achieve net zero affect the, the potential for nature recovery networks? For example, land use changes arising from changes to agriculture, agricultural practices, you know, moving from plant-based um, moving to plant-based priorities over meat-based, uh, for example, you know, when it comes to energy generation, you know, we, we, I've even come across myself, a field of solar panels in Northern Ireland, I didn't know this existed, <laughs> um, you know, wind farms and so on, uh, changes in housing. Um, so I guess I am, the, the question is really just, you know, how do we, how might this um, affect, um, even the approach that we we are taking towards nature carbon networks yeah um yeah big question and yeah of course it could you know our approach to achieving net zero or zero eventually is um could have a terrible impact on our ability to achieve a nature recovery network it depends how we do it doesn't it um we've got to we've got to change everything we do you know every single system that we have we have to change so you know it's a huge uh a huge undertaking for us uh, but nature can play a huge role in this. So if we do it right, we can utilize nature-based solutions for mitigation. And that, you know, I mentioned the carbon storage and sequestration by Habitat report. Hopefully it's a good resource to help us think about that. Um, yeah, I mean, we need to work on creating sustainable agriculture and embracing some of those changes in, you know, yeah, dietary changes are going to be important. But I think it's really important and often this gets forgotten is we need to reduce our food waste. You know, we're wasting tons and millions of tons of food. Uh, our consumption patterns, you know, they drastically need to change. So that's a huge toll on our kind of, you know, land use uh, competition. Um, we really can do sort of maladaptation and malmitigation if we're not careful. So we could do that whole, you know, planting loads of eucalyptus or whatever to sequester carbon quickly, but we can do it in that multifunctional way. You know, we can produce those nature-based solutions for people, for adaptation, for mitigation. We can have it contribute to the nature recovery network. Um, so deciduous woodlands, for example, instead of, um, you know, that are in the relevant places, are going to be really important carbon stores. It doesn't have to be uh, coniferous plantations in forestry. You know, it can be biodiversity beneficial. It can have recreation um, benefits. It can provide flood uh, attenuation and mitigation, and it can provide nature too, and all that stuff that we need to do, as well as restoring all of our peatlands and things like that. So there's plenty we can do. Um, and it's yeah, really important that we think globally as well as locally and nationally and um, yeah, put it in that that wider context. But yeah, if we're not careful, we could go down the wrong route. Yeah, it's, I guess, at the same time, an opportunity, uh, you know, for nature-based solutions um, on the whole, you know, Nature Recovery Network is very much representing that as a concept, yeah. but also at the same time being aware of what was just highlighted in the, in, in the questions, you know, the risk, of it going sort of the other way as actually preventing the delivery of, of something that we call now nature recovery networks. Um, so 100%. Um, there was a question that I have lost now. Um, hold on. Yeah, I guess this is a little bit on the same theme. Um, I think this came in anonymously for Kate. Um, um, I think this was in reference to the data set that you touched upon when it comes to soils, um, which I think you called land capability for agriculture. Um, has, has there, are you aware whether in Scotland, um, there's been um, 
it's been looked at in terms of capability for other public benefits as well in terms of carbon flood risk and and so on obviously that goes back to the kind of the whole ecosystem services and multiple benefits um system i wonder just is do you have awareness of anything like that having taken place kate um having a quick scroll i can't see the exact question so apologies if i i, I don't exactly answer it and um, we we used the yeah the, the soil data we looked at um we did briefly look at some other ecosystem services data which sepa held uh, which isn't publicly available um so i guess comes back to some of the points sarah was making about there's great data out there but can you use it and, and who can you share it with um but um, we, we kindly um, reviewed it via SEPA systems, uh, although couldn't share it with our, our uh, sort of our, our group who are doing the mapping. Um, and SEPA does have some great data on um, the sort of importance of different areas across Scotland. So that, that's Scottish Environment Protection Agency. They have some great data on the importance of um, locations for uh, recreation, for example. Um, so yes I, again um there is definitely data out there um uh but yes it's that i mean you, you perhaps can't select all data to look at um and it's making those choices of picking certain types of data so rather than going and looking at large amount of recreation data we use the scottish index for of multiple uh, deprivation to think about actually where the most important places to consider that uh, that kind of uh, people impact could be. So the area that we covered across central Scotland, it doesn't include um, any of the national parks. Um, it doesn't include any, uh, uh, it sort of includes part of the upland area in the, in the Oakle Hills and Clack Manninshire. Um, but um, lots of the locations which probably would be very impacted by recreation in Scotland are actually perhaps outside of the area. Saying that, it's going to come back to bite me. There's obviously lots of people in the central belt. Um, but yeah, there's certainly other things we could have looked at and we may look at in the future. Great. Um, that was fantastic. Thanks very much for that. Um, I think in terms of the Q&A, we'll leave it there because we've, we're already at 12.30. Um, uh, so I will try to very quickly launch our last slide and then just recap very quickly and hopefully we'll only be five or 10 minutes past our original scheduled time slot. Uh, so thank you very much for everybody who is still holding on there in the audience. Um, I shall just share my screen very quickly and hopefully this works because this is very much an interesting question which was touched upon already earlier really in our previous question, you know, when it comes to we talk about data sets and we talk about modeling, but they're only ever going to be a snapshot in time. So this comes very much back to what Ian is also working on and the, the potential of, of having data sets updated um, on a regular basis. But what could that actually mean, you know, practically when it comes to nature recovery networks? We talk about maps, but we also talk about strategies and, and, and goals. So how often do you think that these should be updated um, or reviewed really in, in Northern Ireland? So we'll leave that there for a few moments and then um, I will recap very quickly and just thank everybody who's been involved. <laughs> Well, we've got three different opinions already <laughs> as data comes available. And I guess that just highlights really that sort of forward looking thinking as well when it comes to setting up databases and frameworks, having something in place that allows these new data sets or reruns of these models, you know, efficiently and, and quickly, rather than having to bring in extra expertise and funding to do that on a regular basis. But also thinking about putting together systems and frameworks which are flexible enough. So when you learn along the way, you can also amend your thinking and even your, you know, models going forward.
it's quite a few people coming in, you know, highlighting annually, but also you having to be quite regular and and um, making sure that when new data becomes available, that it is included when when it's relevant. A couple of comments coming through, you know, highlighting the the need to understand the actual strategies that these maps might be feeding into. So obviously that needs to fit within that. A very good point. Yep, the importance of clarifying what is success as well. So what are you actually measuring? A very relevant point. Because we're not just talking about, you know, when we talk about nature recovery networks and expanding the network, like we touched upon, it's not just about having them or creating new habitats on the ground, but making sure that they actually deliver towards a functioning network and provide that service that, um, you know, that they should be capable of, of providing. So it's, it's about functional connectivity um, more, more than anything. Right, we might leave it there just so we don't run over too much, but thank you very much for all of those responses. And like I said, again, we'll get, um, we'll get record of all of this. And I think when I now stop the, the sharing, I think the, the link, to this particular question will stay live and we'll we'll keep it open for a good hour after this in case you have any burning opinions on this um, after we finish. So um, really uh, to conclude, thank you very, very much um, for everybody for being on the call today. I think we can all I've very much enjoyed all of the three sessions and I think the conversations that we've been having and the presentations that we've been hearing have been extremely interesting and useful when it comes to conversations to what nature recovery networks could mean for us in, in Northern Ireland. So a huge thanks goes to all, our, all of our presenters um, and all, especially all of you really in, in the audience and for taking the time and interacting uh, with us and asking all of those questions. I think it's been fantastic. I think we've had more than 50 people um, on all of these sessions. So it's been just nice to see the, the level of interest, but also the, the spectrum of, of people when it comes to, um, to who's been in attendance, um, which is obviously something that we keep on talking about when it comes to working on this together and making sure that all of the stakeholders um, that this is relevant to um, have ability to, to be involved. So thank you very, very much for being on the call today. Um, I guess when it comes to um, sort of summary of, of today's messages, I think it was quite clear that um, there is a lot that can feed into the sort of design and thinking about nature recovery networks from remote sensing, but then also highlighting that importance of, of ground truthing, data availability, data access, but like I said, that um, stakeholder involvement as well. Um, in terms of our own mapping exercise, I've got the first question there uh, in terms of how can you actually help? So if you feel like you personally or your organization could actually play a role and not just in kind of delivering nature recovery networks in Northern Ireland, but also in terms of contributing towards um, our mapping exercise, do get in touch. You have my contact details there. Any feedback or thoughts obviously are very, very welcome. And we will also be sending a feedback form uh, shortly after this webinar. So do let us know how useful you found or unuseful you found these webinars and whether you would be interested in any further workshops if, if we were capable of, of um, organizing them. Um, 
And if you haven't already respond to the Slido question, um, oh, and one thing I clearly forgot to take out from the previous uh, presentation was that we obviously this is the last session, so we don't have any more sessions in terms of, of this series. Um, so thank you very, very much for being on the call today. Thank huge, huge thank you for, for the presenters and your willingness to, to be put on the spot as well um, when it comes to the Q&A. And obviously thank you to, to Monica and Laura behind the scenes. You have done uh, brilliant work with sharing all the links. So I think what we'll do today again is that we'll collate all of those links and, and share them with all the attendees because there's quite a few. So I'm sure you weren't able to necessarily pick them all out. And obviously, um, it's not just me, I'm just the, the lucky person uh, here uh, who is the face really of the project, but there's a lot of other people working behind the scenes in the partner organizations contributing towards the project. So it's not just me, and obviously we weren't, wouldn't be here if it wasn't uh, for our funder HLF, so thank you very, very much for that. And obviously their contribution towards the other initiatives um, that have been talked about today has already been highlighted as well. Um, so I guess we'll leave it there. So we're only nine minutes uh, behind schedule, which isn't too bad. Um, so thank you very, very much uh, one more time. And hopefully we'll continue having these conversations going forward. So any feedback or comments, do please get in touch and, um, and we'll see how this all progresses for us here in Northern Ireland. <laughs>